Right. right. Hello. My iPhone has been updated to iOS 12. Uh, it's very kind there, Brian. I'm glad you shared that with us. Thanks a bunch. Uh, now what you going to do? Well, if I'm very clever, I will edit this show into a, or this recording into a recognizable podcast and then release it to the publics. Wouldn't that be nice? I'm certain there's a way to do this. Okay, here we go. Yes, there is a way to do this. And I am doing it that way. Just as soon as anything wants to cooperate in any kind of other way. Right, there we go. Now I can see the chat. And I can see all of you who aren't there. So that'll be great. Anyway, what I'm doing is I've just finished recording. Uh, this is an entire raw recording of this coming week's episode of GM Word of the Week. Um, as you can see, hopefully... there. Anyway, you will see the title and the number of things going on there, right there, and that's a thing. So, there we are. It's all good. Great. I knew you'd love it. Don't talk back to me. Are you loving it? I'm loving it. Let's all love it together, just for a moment. Oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to advertise it myself now. Let's not. There we, there we go. go. Good. Who cares? Uh, all right. So anyway, I have recorded, I have this, have recorded this entire thing. thing. It's, it's about, about 36, 36 minutes, minutes of audio, audio, a little over. If you look right down here, you will see the duration of the whole thing. 36 minutes, 12 seconds. Very good stuff. Very fun. Now, the thing of it is, uh, that is not how long our episodes usually run, uh, which means that there is some trimming that needs to happen uh, even in the wonderful script we have got already. Now what I've done is this is obviously Adobe Audition. See, I've recorded it in this uh, using my setup and it came out looking like this. Okay, lots of highs and lows and that kind of stuff. It needs some work. It needs some general work and it needs some specific work. So all I do is I go down here to the bottom and I drag up this uh, this graphic here, which is the same thing as this audio here, the, all the waves and the things here. This is just a different way of looking at the signal and the recording. And basically what it's telling me is there is um, uh, noise in here that I need to get rid of. And there's always noise in there. And some of it's worse. You probably wouldn't even hear most of this. But I don't like it being there. So let's see what it's got. Iron Bands of Bellaro. Yeah, yeah okay. okay. Um, so, so this isn't going to work, work because... Oh, well, maybe it will work. work. Hang on, I'll, I'll do, do that. that. Iron Bands of Bellaro. Right, right, that, that will work, work, so, so I, can I can hear myself. myself. Okay. okay. Good, good, good. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what, what I've got, got here is a lot of noise, noise, and I need to get rid of some of it. So, so this, this is all very easy in Adobe Audition. Uh, what, you what you do is, is the easiest thing first is to select, select a section, section right-click it, and capture noise print. print. Okay? okay? Now, now normally, normally you'd want a bigger section than that, but I, it's a 30-minute file. It's going to be down to 26. There's not a lot of open space. I didn't leave myself a lot of open space. So that's fine. Okay, so I've captured the noise print. Now I'm going to select the entire file. Go up here to Effects, Noise Reduction and run the noise reduction process. This is what the noise looks like. Okay? And you can you can see you just mouse right along it here and it tells you everything you need to know. Okay? All of this noise at minus 100 or better, you'll never hear ever. Uh, but this stuff that approaches right up here to this line, you will eventually hear. Okay? 
Uh, it just depends on how loud the file gets. So I like to take it out altogether. All right? Everything, everything below that mark should go away. And I don't mess with much of these. The only thing I've ever changed in here is where it says spectral decay rate. Uh, sometimes when you take audio out, it leaves some weird echoey artifact at the end of, at the end of everything. Uh, and reducing this number from its original 80% or whatever it was to 10% makes it a little better. So anyway, I'm going to apply all this. It'll do its magical little runny thing there. Take a few seconds. Believe me, this is a lot of fun on a two-hour file, like we do for Digressions and Dragons. Do-do-do-do. Okay. And hopefully now you can see that there's much less noise. It's not perfect. There's still some sections like this little thing here, a little bit there, some of this in between stuff. But by and large, the majority of the noise is now gone. To prove that to you, we will go back here. Iron Bands of Bellaro. Okay. It will probably come as no... It's very quiet now. Excellent, Excellent stuff. stuff. Um, the next piece is uh, what I call a noise gate, and, but it's generally found elsewhere. So control A to select the entire sound file. Previous experience has told me that if I go into dynamics processing, processing, I will have this already set up. And I can't listen to myself on that big a delay. <laughs> anyway, um, the, these lines basically tell you what sound is going to get past the gate and what sound is not. Okay, okay, this, this is, is the break line, line here. This is where everything, everything above, above this point, point is going to make it past, past the gate. gate. Any, Any sound, sound below this point in volume, volume not going to make it past, past the gate. gate. So, so it's, it's just, just going to disappear, disappear, basically. basically. Okay? Uh, and, it's and it's taken me a lot of playing around to get the right settings on this. Because initially when you have this, it looks like that. Okay, it's, it's just default, default, it's a flat line, line does, does nothing, nothing really. really. Okay. okay. But, but if I come, come back, back in here, here. Uh, right. right. Good, Good job. job. Somehow that, that has not been saved. saved. Okay. okay. If all this fails, fail, stop, stop and start, start again. again. Oh, good, 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 good. good. Where? Oh, there it is. Okay. Someday I'm going to remember to change that so my name's first. <laughs> anyway, so we went from the flat line, which you can see is in gray here, and then continues up this way. And I picked a point and just dropped the noise after that. So you've got point one, which is segment one. Uh, the ratio is just how hard the compression is. It's neutral, and everything above 35.14 dB is okay to go. Okay. Anyway, you're going to play around with this more than anything else, uh, because my settings aren't going to work for you because you don't have my voice set up in equipment. There you go. So I'm going to apply this to the entire file. If you watch these little fuzzy bits here, fuzzy bits there, fuzzy bits there... I'm going, I'm going to apply, to apply this. this. And those, those fuzzy, fuzzy bits are not gone. gone. See? See? That's a much, much cleaner, cleaner file. file. And I haven't, I haven't lost, lost any of the audio. audio. Any of the audio I want to keep is fine. Iron Bands of Bellaro. See? See? Nice, nice huh? huh? Okay. okay.
Next, Next step. step. We're still, We're still just, just massaging, massaging things, things here. here. Um, I can I go can one of two, two routes. routes. I can, I can either, either apply, apply amplification, amplification now, now or I can I not do that, that, which is a good, good idea because, because there's still lots of incidental noise and thing in here, things in here that, that will need, need to be fixed and dealt with. with. Okay. okay. So at this, so at point, this point, what I'm really going to do is I'm going to wind this back. back. I'm going to zoom, zoom myself, myself in. I'm just rolling the scroll wheel here. here. And we'll and start, start listening to the file, file. and correcting and as we go. go. And I will, I will, I will tell, tell you what, what I do as we go. go. Iron Bands of Bellaro. Okay, that's okay, all fine. fine. Now, now, if you're familiar with the way episodes, episodes work, work, there's some intro music. It stops, uh, depending on the mood of the episode, I add some new music, it fades in, or I just let it play through a little bit and then add music, whatever. Whatever we do, don't need this half of the music here, or the file here, the empty space. So we just highlight it, hit delete, and everything adjusts. Okay. Iron Bands of Bellaro. It will probably come as no surprise that we here at the Word of the Week love word games. After all, each one of our episodes is basically just a running game of free association. Which is why one of our favorite pieces of poetry contains the following lines. The time has come, the walrus said, to talk of many things. Of shoes and ships and sealing wax, of cabbages and kings. And why the sea is boiling hot. And whether pigs have wings. And whether pigs have wings. Yeah, so yeah, there was so a weird, weird whistle, whistle in there, and I just, and I just took it out. I'm going to take it out now. Uh, basically, basically, as I, I record, record, I listen to myself, and I can kind of judge, judge where the problems, where the problems are. are. And I just auto, I just, I, just, I repeat, repeat the words, the words uh, that I want, I want and, and I can fix it like this. So, so I highlight the section of, that's got the got problem in it, and I want it to go away. And I want to fit this section. The, the, this, 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 the good part, part the part I want to keep, keep, come up come to up here, here. Okay. okay? Basically, Basically occupy the, the same, same space, space because the, the timing, timing was okay. okay. Um, so, so I want, I want to make sure I trim in about the same way at the front as I do at the back, or at the back as I do at the front. Take your pick. Anyway, that's a highlight and a delete. And now two separate takes, essentially. Why the sea is boiling hot and whether pigs have wings. Much better. We also, as we have mentioned before, love running. Now that, now that seems. seems. We also like, like kind, kind of, of a long, long pause, pause in there. It's, it's two, two seconds. seconds. Uh, it's, it's not a really a long, long pause, pause, but what, but what it, it is, is, it's a little place for the music to play under. under. Uh, and, and the music will fill in that gap, gap and you won't even know there's a pause there, really, because you hear something. Boiling hot. And whether pigs have wings. We also, as we have mentioned before, love running down a good gaming mystery. For previous examples, see our episodes about the cloak of the mountebank and the elemental deity Kosuth. And when it comes to running down a good gaming mystery, there is no better source of mysteries than the names of various things in Dungeons and Dragons. Monsters, magical items, locations, and characters. See, for every bugbear in Malabranche that's a pretty direct reference to a piece of classical mythology, folklore, religion, or literature, there's at least two more Nistals and Blodgets that are references to such obscure things of personal interest to the authors of the game. Now, now there's, there's a weird, a weird pause, pause here because, because the sentence, sentence as I was reading it turned out to be really awkward. Uh, and the timing was wrong. Uh, so I've immediately taken a retake. <clears throat> See, for every bugbear in Malabranchi, that's a... So I can so just, I can just grab, grab from the start, the start here, here where I want, I want. Uh, pick, pick it up, it up and drag, drag the highlight. highlight. There's at least two more. No, no. go back further. More nistles and blood. Whoops. Whoops. And characters. See, 
for every bug bear. There we go. Uh, it's weird, but they just did an update on Adobe Audition, and I've just noticed it's working slightly different. Okay. Patients and characters. See, for every bugbear in Malabranchi, that's a pretty direct reference to a piece of classical mythic... I botched, I botched it. it. So I know this See, is See, for wrong. every bugbear in Malabranchi, that's a pretty direct reference to a piece of classical mythic... Mm -hmm. that's what I See, for every bugbear or Malabranchi, that's a pretty direct reference to a piece of a classical mythology of classical... Whoa! Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's my problem. There's a word that doesn't need to be there. See, for every... All right, let's try, let's try it. it. Now that, I, now that I've gotten now over the writing, writing and gotten over my pronouncing, pronouncing. see if I've got a complete take. take. Magical items, locations, and characters. See, for every bugbear in Malabranchi, that's a pretty direct reference to a piece of classical mythology, folklore, religion, or literature... There's at least two more Nistals and Blodgetts that are references to sub obscure things of personal interest to the authors of the game that no one in their right mind would ever know or recognize. That's totally wrong. Yeah, yep. didn't get didn't it that, that time either. either. There's at least two more Nistals and... But we're close, close. and I didn't have to redo the whole thing. Obscure things of personal interest to the authors of the... There's at least... There's, There's the, the bit. bit. Light it up. There we go. Literature. There's at least. Now, one thing you need to be aware of when you do something like that. You see the shadow right here. This little, this little shadow right in here. This is a breath. Okay. But because I've taken out the actual line that that breath leads into, it comes off rather abrupt. You can't. I don't know if you can hear it or not. But it's but just it's a very, very sharp, sharp cut-off cut noise. noise. There's at least... So, so, what happens, happens is you pick it up. You, you can, can see down here in the bottom. bottom. You can you see can the, sh the shadow. And, and then, then you can, can see the gap. gap. And then the, the next, next bit of shadow and into the word. word. So, what so what you do is you pick it up in the gap as best you can. Highlight it. Right-click it. And silence it. Now that, now, that doesn't, doesn't exist, exist all. all. At all. So, so the shadow's gone, gone, the breath is gone, gone and it sounds, sounds better. better. There's at least two more Nistals and Blodgetts that are references to such obscure things of personal interest to the authors of the game that no one in their right mind would ever know or recognize. And those actually far outnumber the Evards of the game that are just made up gibberish words. Okay. okay. Does that pause, pause in, here? in here? Right here, right between, here between this bit, this bit and this bit? Recognize. And those actually. That's too long. It doesn't sound long, but it's too long. Natural human speaking rhythm doesn't allow for a pause like that. So I'm going to shorten it. Like so. Recognize. And those actually far out number the Evards of the game that are just made up gibberish words. Or so claim the game's many creators. So when friend and supporter of the show, uh, what? Nistel? Blodgett, you want to know what those are references to? Okay, let's start with Blodgett. To be fair, Blodgett doesn't appear to be a reference. So... Now, now, you'll, you'll notice, notice that I don't, that sound, I don't like sound like me, me when, when I'm doing, doing this. this. Okay? okay, it's, it's uh, it, doesn't it doesn't have, have as, as much, much baritone, baritone in it. In it. As, as it, it does, does when you normally hear me talking. Uh, and that's because the microphone and setup I use, while very good, are in fact um, almost too good. They're designed for radio broadcast, uh, where you at home can adjust your mixer and all that kind of stuff, so it sounds good. Um, but on a podcast, an electronic file or whatever, that that's not there. You don't do that. Your MP3 player generally doesn't allow for that sort of thing. So I have to go back in uh, later on 
and re-EQ or equalize this whole thing. Uh, and you'll see me do that. I'll show that to you if you stick around long enough. Uh, I eventually, I will eventually sound like I need to. It'd be great. Okay. Let's start with Blodgett. To be fair, Blodgett doesn't appear. Let's start with Blodgett. Okay. Right in here. Blodgett. Blodgett. Is a tick. You hear the tick? I can tell you exactly where it is. It is this right here. That's the tick. Hear it? See? Right there. Okay, I don't want that. So... It used, it used to be in the past, past I'd, have I'd have to go in there myself and erase, erase the whole the thing, thing and blah, 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 whatever. whatever. I can auto heal. Auto See, auto heal selection. selection. That's gone, gone now. now. Logic. With Blogic. Yeah, yep. almost all gone. gone. Still has a bit of fuzzy. If you look at the line, you can see it kind of, I mean, if we zoomed way in, it's not very smooth. But, but in, in particular, particular, in this highlighted area, area, you can see it gets really zigzaggy. That's, that's the noise, noise that we don't want. want. So we're going to auto heal again. There we go. All gone. If you look down here, you'll see it looks markedly different. Logic. Logic. Yep, not there. To be fair, Blodgett doesn't appear to be a reference so much as a name stolen in desperation. Blodgett was a halfling thief who originally helped a party of heroes named... Elwitta, Ogre, Freda, Caraway, Dread Delgath, Fantstern, Fanstern, and Elgeus. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you go, go ahead, ahead and try to read those. Delgath, Fanstern. And we just, we just trim, trim the, the silence, silence so it sounds so more natural. natural. I helped a party of heroes named. Elwitta, Ogre, Freda, Caraway, Dread Delgath, Fanstern, and Elgeus defeat the slave lords of Flinaeus. See, once upon a time, see. Got another Got tick in there if you can hear it. You can, see, you can it. see it. It's right there. there. That's, That's the tick. tick. That big, big bright, bright patch. patch. That's, That's a tick. tick. Auto heal. See. There. There. Once upon a time, there was this series of Dungeons and Dragons adventure modules called the A series. At the time when TSR published modules, they would use letters and numbers to divide them into different series. The A series, later called the Scourge of the Slave Lords, consisted of four modules, A1 through A4, in which they... Mm -mm. A4. There's another tick. Those ticks happen just because you're talking. Your mouth, uh, the saliva in your mouth forms bubbles and other little cavities. I know it's disgusting, but those pop and then they get picked up by the mic and they show up on the recording. And we don't want those. So highlight. And there we go in which the heroes confronted some coastal raiders, discovered they were raiding on behalf of a massive slave ring, tracked the slavers to their lair beneath a volcanic island, and eventually escaped the dungeons of the slave lords. But, before the modules were published and sold, yep. they were created by TSR for use in a tournament at the Gen Con 1980... <clears throat> There's another word that doesn't belong. What is he doing? Who has written this script? And better yet, you proofread it. Proofread it. Anyway. <clears throat> but before the... Mo yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, this happens, happens a, lot. a lot. It's, it's not, not a big, big deal. deal. It's just it's sometimes, sometimes things, things are written, are written and then corrected, corrected and then don't, don't get, get rewritten re or checked. <clears throat> There's another word. And I missed it on my first read-through. That doesn't... There. That's 
where I want to be. Engines of the slave lords. But before the modules were. That's a long, awkward silence. Make it shorter. Engines of the slave lords. But before the modules were published and sold, they were created by TSR for use in a tournament at Gen Con 13 in 1980. And because they were tournament modules, they included a set of pre-generated characters that players would use to play through the module. The idea was basically that each group would take on the same modules with the same set of PCs, earn a score, and the party that scored the highest won. Which means... Too long. Too long. Um, I, I guess, guess I, do I do this in a fairly in unorthodox way. way. Orthodox, orthodox way. way. Um, um, normally... normally Hi, Consumar. Uh, normally, the file, as done by professionals, gets cut into sections, okay? And each section represents a certain amount of words and all that stuff. Uh, and then those are assembled, right? But that happens in kind of interview formats where you've where you need to edit and trim and make a story fit a certain amount of time and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I don't do that because I'm the only one on this. And so I just record the entire thing and then fix it as we go, you know, and listen to it. Uh, it just, I find that works better for me. Um, so, okay, where were we? Score and the party that scored the highest won. Which means the designers of the modules, David Cook, Alan Hammock, Harold Johnson, Tom Moldvay, Lawrence Schick, and Edward Carmian, had to come up with a bunch of pre-generated characters and name them all. And naming characters was always a pain in the butt. Remember that. It'll be important later. For example, we're pretty sure that the character LJS is actually just Lawrence Schick's initials. We can't say that categorically, though, because we can't find any reference to his middle name. And we looked. And as for Blodgett? Uh, uh, okay, okay, so a couple, couple of questions, questions here. here. And the cave, the cave echo, of, the cave echo the effect, effect is probably due to the fact that um, you're getting the, both the microphone and the system, system playback, playback at the same time on the speech. Okay? So, I mean, if it helps differentiate, great. Accidental happiness. Uh, if it's just annoying, then I apologize, but it's not likely to get fixed right now. Not in the middle of everything. Uh, and then Arthur asked if dig and drag is handled a little differently. Yes, dig and drag is handled a little differently. Uh, because one of the things I have to do is take both pieces in. Scott's side and my side and time, time them correctly, correctly so, that they, so that they play, play where they're, they're supposed to play. Uh, and, and then the live editing happens to both files, files at the same time, time. rather than and me going, going through, through and doing, doing one, one, you know, doing all my stuff, doing all, stuff, doing all his, his stuff, stuff, and then trying to assemble it, because that messes up the timing. timing. So, so I listen to both tracks simultaneously, simultaneously and then correct as that goes. All right. As we can't find any reference to his middle name. And we looked. And as for Blodgett? In 1848, a Vermont tavern owner hired a local stove maker to build an oven for his tavern. The stove maker was Gardner S. Blodgett. And he... Mm -hmm. Oh, excuse me. Yes. yes. And he gained... I, I will apologize now for any... Uh, body, body function, function sounds, sounds that make it through. It through. Um, um, one, one of the things, things that, that happens, happens, at least to me, me and I assume it happens to other people, people, is if I have, I have to talk, talk for an extended, extended period of time, uh, because of the way my, my voice, voice resonates, 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 resonates uh, uh, it, tends tends to, it tends to disturb, disturb the, the internal, internal workings, workings and produce things, things like, like burps, burps and whatnot. So I apologize now. We'll try to take those out. Hopefully you've never heard one. The stove maker was Gardner S. Blodgett. And he... Oh, excuse me. 
and he gained such a rep. Okay, so all that's useless. Back here. Gardner S. Blodgett. And he gained such a reputation for quality that soon he was making ovens for everyone. Today, Blodgett Corporation, the same company founded by that stove maker in 1848, is one of the biggest manufacturers of commercial ovens. And if you spend any time behind the counter in a pizza parlor anywhere in the United States, you've probably seen the name Blodgett scrawled across a pizza. Yeah. Yeah. No. No. You've probably. There's no there's pizza, pizza oven. Besides, besides which, which that, that, there's a little. The, the apostrophe, apostrophe V-E of you didn't, didn't come through very well. So that's so fine. fine. Just take it out. In the United States, you've probably seen the name Blodgett scrawled across a pizza oven. Now, we fully admit that this could be a weird coincidence. But young gamers and youngish game designers spend a lot of time around pizza. So we're willing to bet it's a lifted name, especially because of how common that stuff is, as you'll soon see. Take our other example, Nistel. Yeah, okay. Left myself a little room there because I wasn't sure I wanted to transition. And we'll just take some of that out. As you'll soon see. Take our other example, Nist. Still not entirely happy. As you'll soon see. Take our other example, Nist. That's better. There are a bunch of magical spells in the D&D universe that are named after specific characters. Bigby's Crushing Hand, Melf's Acid Arrow, and Morden Kanan's Lucubration. And Morden Kanan's Lucubration. Yeah. And Morden... Acid Arrow, and Morden Kanan's Lucubration. Which is not! Yes, we often misread it to our own embarrassment when we were finally corrected. Morden Kanan's Lubrication. Just to name a few. And they're all named after various characters from the early days of the game. Mostly they are named after the characters people played in the earliest Dungeons & Dragons games. But Nistel's magical aura was once unique in that it was the only spell in the game named after a living human person and not a game character. It's just not the living person most people think. The spell, Nist. Okay. So every once in a while I give myself a break and manage to get a couple lines right in a row. Um, which is always nice. Uh, but this, this gap in here. Okay, that one that I've just highlighted. You can see, if you can work out the math up here at the top in the timeline, how long that is. If you can't, look down over here at the bottom right, and it tells you selection, start, end, and duration. So that gap is all of 1.81 seconds long. Almost two seconds, okay? Now, to listen to it, most people think, the spell. That's, That's just, just on the verge of being almost, almost too long, long, being an awkward, awkward pause. pause. But, but it's, it's there because, because as I read, read and as, as I, say I say the lines, lines I, think I think to myself, myself about natural, natural breaks, breaks between, between one, one subject and the next and, and where, where I can, I can put, put music, music starting and music, and music ending, ending and that kind of stuff. stuff. And, and I, I think, think that's, that's going to be a start, start spot for some music. So a little longer there is not a bad thing. The spell, Nistel's Magic Aura, was a... S mm -hmm. Got something wrong. The spell, Nistel's Magical Aura. Okay, so we come back. Snug that up. Hit delete. Person most people think. The spell, Nistel's Magical Aura allows a spellcaster to imbue a mundane object with a magical aura. In essence, in essence, it makes a normal... Yeah, yeah. another little bobble. Sometimes, Sometimes I catch myself thinking in the middle of things. things. In essence. And I don't, and I don't want to do, do that. that. Not while I'm reading. That dis that's a distraction and makes, and makes it hard, hard to do anything. Aura. In essence, it makes a normal... 
mundane object with a magic aura. In essence, it makes a normal, boring, everyday thing appear to be an exciting, magical thing. It's a scam spell. A con. You can pass off a normal object as magical. The spell originally appeared in the 1978 Advanced Dungeons & Dragons Player's Handbook. In 1995, a recently hired TSR employee named Mike Nistel claimed that the spell had, in fact, been named after him, and that he had the distinction of being the only real person for whom a spell had been named. This was in an article in Dragon Magazine, issue 219. Look it up. Mike claimed to have gotten started playing RPGs a decade prior, in 1985. Which means he had a spell named after him before he played the game? Which means he... No. Nope. Nope. Okay. okay. Uh, a lot of this, this is, is correcting, correcting just oddball, oddball noises. Noise. Um, if you listen to this section, right at the tail end, where, where this little bright line is right here, you're going to hear an oddball sound that doesn't really belong there. Which means he... Which means... Which means... Hear that kind of pop? Which means... Which means... That right there? There's a There's pop, a pop right, right in there that doesn't, doesn't need to be there. there. It's, it's it's a weird, weird distraction. distraction. Uh, so, so I'm, I'm going, going to correct, correct it, it, I think. think. Uh, there, that's the one I want. So, okay. You see, I have a regular cursor up, cursor up here and insert, highlight cursor, right? And it changes as I come down here. Because what this does is let me mark out an area that will then be corrected by the software to a more uh, normal sort of sound. It'll look at the information around it, where, wherever I highlight information around it, average all that out, and create a patch over the top of the bad thing. So I'm going to come in here, and that's my bad thing. And you see it made it go away. Which means... Yep. Yep. Okay, can't hear that pop now. Which means he had a... Sp which means he had a spell named after him before he played the game? That seems kind of odd. Well, Gary Gygax actually cleared up the confusion in a forum post years later. It turns out the spell was named for one Brad Nistel, a stage magician who had suggested the idea of the deceptive spell at Gen Con one year. Interestingly, though, a game designer named Len Lakovka said he ran a game for an entire clan of Nistals one time, including Brad, Jenny, Mike, and Brian. And Mike and Brian, who both went on to be game designers at TSR and FOSA respectively, admit their father got them into role-playing games and had worked in theater, lending credence to the idea that Brad Nistel may have been their father and Gary's account might be accurate. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah, the software, the software is, is actually, actually really easy once, once you get used, used to it, or, or, at or at least take the time, time to learn the very, very basics of what, what you, you want to do. do. Uh, I, started I started with, with just, just, can I silence, silence audio? audio? And can, can I, I cut, cut audio? audio? And, and once, once I've got, got those two, two down, down, I can, I can pretty, pretty much, much do all the other stuff. I'll just learn as I go. And as long as I know how to undo things and back up, then it's not a big problem. I can't really screw anything up. Uh, it's like when I learned to drive, my father took me out, and we didn't learn how to steer and signal and you know shift gears and all that kind of stuff. First thing we learned was how to stop. So that if something went wrong, you just you stopped. Okay. And that's, and that's kind of this. this. How, How do you, you undo, undo whatever, whatever it is you just did? did. Once you've Once got you that, that, you don't have to be afraid, afraid to try, try things. things. <coughs> Excuse, Excuse me. me. Um, um, and the, the reason, reason I'm, I'm catching, catching things, things that you're not you're catching, because I have headphones, headphones and they're turned, they're turned up loud, loud so I can so hear all the things underneath. 
So the really aggravating part is I can hear myself talking and I wish I couldn't. I'll have to work out how to fix that at some point. Because it's delayed by half a second, which is, if you've ever had that, is really hard. Concentrating on what you're saying. Pardon me. <coughs> Excuse me again. Anyway. Ray's account might be accurate. However, Mike insists to this day that it's his name, not his father's, on the spell. And we'll probably never know the truth. But we digress. The point is, the name... Okay. I feel like you can't have two very long pauses on both sides of... We digress. Uh, give me a second here. I'm going to get some drink. Be right back. Pretend we're having fun. Okay. I'm back. I'm back. I know you missed me. Got my drink. All right. But we digress. The point is, the names in the Dungeons and Dragons universe are always great game. Whoop, whoop. Did you hear it? It's right there. As you go along, you'll develop an eye for it. You'll know what it looks like more than what it sounds like. That right there. See? Are always great gaming fodder for a good, complicated mystery. And as names like LJ, good, complicated mystery. And mm -mm. too long. For a good complicated mystery. And as names like what am I saying? Universe are always great gaming fodder for a good complicated mystery. And as names like LJS suggest, they're also a great source of wordplay. Okay. So when friend and supporter of the show, The Warbo, suggested we explore the origins of the Iron Bands of Billaro, a very old and... So, so I'm only working in audio, audio, right? I can't, I can't throw, throw up, up a flag, flag or, or highlight, highlight something, something or uh, make it make flash, it flash on, on and off, whatever, whatever, so that you, you notice, notice it and think about, about it. it. So you so use silence. silence. Uh, I, want I want you, you to hear the name, name and then I want, I want you to you spend, spend like half, half a second, second thinking, thinking about, about what, what it is and registering, registering it. it. So when friend and supporter of the show, The Warbo, suggested we explore the origins of the... And that's, and that's what, that what that kind of, kind of extended, extended pause, pause is about. about. The Warbo suggested we explore the origins of the Iron Bands of Billaro. A very old enchanted item from the earliest days of Dungeons and Dragons, we couldn't resist. And when we finally did figure out the mystery, we had a hearty laugh, because of all the people who could have suggested this particular topic, it was most appropriate coming from the Warbo. But we'll come back to that. Okay. So, <laughs> we have done eight minutes. And 16, 16 seconds, seconds of, of setup, setup before, before we get to the, the episode, episode proper. proper. <laughs> so what you're what paying, paying for? for?
All right. I would have got it. We'll come back to that. The Iron Bands of Billero, currently spelled with two L's, but originally... Okay. So, another music transition break. I'm just going to delete, or not delete, but uh, silence all that. So, basically, what silence does is exactly what it says. It deletes all the noise and just returns everything to zero. So, there's no noise there at all now. And that's long enough. I just, I don't have any rules. I just play it by ear. Nobody taught me anything. But we'll come back to that. The Iron Bands of Billero. So yeah, there's music transition right in there. Uh, I'm only just now realizing how sensitive this mic is right here. So I might like, back it out a little. Just so it's not right up in my face. There we go. That's probably better. You can hear me okay, yeah? If you can't hear me, just say so. The Iron Bands of Billero, currently spelled with two L's, but originally spelled with one L. Currently spelled with two L's, but originally spelled with one Yeah, there's another little pop thing in there. But originally spelled with one L. Two L's, but originally spelled with one L. And that distinction is important. The Iron Bands of Billero are, well, well, is, uh, um, okay, so, look, uh, this is one of those tricky things. No, 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 no. I, do I do this, do this like, like three different three times, times, trying, trying to, get to get the right, the right feel, feel for it. For things where the item is, the Iron Bands of Billero, currently spelled with two L's, but originally spelled with one L, and that distinction is important. The Iron Bands of Billero are... Well, well, is, uh, um, okay, so, look, uh, this is one of those tricky things where the item is singular, but contains a plural in the name, so the subject verb are... No, no, not happy. happy. The Iron Bands of Billero are, or, 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 the ban Iron Bands of Billero, hmm. The Iron Bands of Billero are... Or, or the Iron Bands of Billero is, or, well, uh, okay, so. Take that out there. But we'll come back to that. The Iron Bands of Billero are, or, or the Iron Bands of Billero is, or, well, Okay, so this is one of those tricky things where the item is singular but contains a plural in the name so the subject-verb agreement is a pain and no matter how you try to say it, it doesn't sound natural and however you write it, you know your editor and producer is going to have an aneurysm and change it. So we're going to do this in the most clumsy but grammatically accurate way we can think of. Yes, we are. The magical object. this in the most clumsy but grammatically accurate way we can think of. The magical object, known as the Iron Bands of Billero, is R, a sphere of entwined metal ribbons that, when thrown at a target and activated with an appropriate magic word, expand or expands and envelops the target. No, no, no. no. Better better the noise. Magic word, expand or expands and envelops the target. And activated with an appropriate magic word, expand or expands and Expand or exp Yeah, there they are. Expand or expands and envelops the target, ultimately imprisoning him. Envelops the target. Too long. Weirdly long. Weirdly long. Envelops the target. Ultimately envelops the target. Ulti envelops the target. Still weird.
develops the target, ultimately imprisoning him or her like a metal mummy. And if you're a fan of the Critical Role Live Play podcast, Which you I'm might not. recognize that object as part of Vox Machina member. And, and so I don't. <laughs> and if you're a fan of the Critical And if you're a fan I have good headphones. I, that's why I hear them. I, I spent the money to get good headphones, just as I spent the money to get good microphones so that it sounds good where it should. That is, that is literally the whole point of the Patreon. Listening him or her like a metal mummy. And if you're a fan of the Critical Role Live Play podcast, you might recognize that object as part of Vox Machina member Percival's arsenal. Percival, or more correctly, Lord Percival... <laughs> okay. Percival, or more correctly, Lord Percival Frederick's... Percival, or more correctly... Yeah, yeah. since, since none, none of those have been correct, correct maybe, maybe this, this will be. One. Percival, or more correctly, member Percival's arsenal. Percival, or more correctly, Lord. <clears throat> Percival, or more correctly, Lord. Uh, what, headphones what headphones do I have? They're Sinal SMH 1000s. S E N A L. S E N A L? S E N A L. Percival's Arsenal. Percival, or more correctly, Lord Percival Frederick Stein von Musel Klausowski Del Rolo III. Can't imagine why I had trouble saying that. Also chose not to deal with the whole issue of singular proper noun phrases with plural words by giving his object known as. Sometimes the requirements of reading a thing are different than the requirements of listening to a thing. Like you only have so much air in your lungs. And sometimes you hit an awkward pause where you have to take a breath or you're out. And you can fix that in post. Of Whitestone. Also chose not to deal with the whole issue of singular proper noun phrases with plural words. Right there. This I'm going to fix. Like that. That's like a whole half second adjustment. With plural words by giving. But now you can hear it reads or listens totally. Also chose not to deal with the whole issue of singular proper noun phrases with plural words by giving his object known as the Iron Bands of Billero a nickname. He calls it manners. Now, the Iron Bands of Billero are or is, as we said, an old magic item. Older than you might think, but not as old as we hope. There's no great mythic... Huh. huh. Why is that there? It's a weird place. Let's get rid of it. We hope. There's no great mythic story we could find that inspired the object. It appears that it's a D&D &D original. And the object... And the object known as the iron... Just taking out yeah, bad, bad takes. takes. <clears throat> the original. And the object known as the Iron Bands of Billero first appeared in the 1985 optional rules supplement Unearthed Arcana. Or at least they first appeared there under that name. But they first appeared in Dungeons and Dragons 11 years earlier. In 1974, Robert J. Kuntz, friend to Gary Gygax and one of the original gamers who tested the very first version of D&D... &D, J. Kuntz, friend to Gary. Another weird break. For breathing purposes. J. Kuntz, friend to Gary Gygax and one of the original gamers who tested the very first version of D&D. &D, Robert Robert Kuntz, friend. Nope, 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 nope. nope. Stop. Stop. Right there. Go away. He, Robert of D&D, &D, 
Robert J. Kuntz designed a section of the sprawling underground complex known as Castle Greyhawk. He named it the Orc Level. And while it has never been published, we... See, see that, that pause. pause. There's a lot of different pauses. Pause. You have to know, you what, know what each pause, pause is, is for before you decide whether to leave it or take it out. out. This, this pause, pause is, is to, to allow for a chuckle. chuckle. The Orc Level. And we'll... See, see, I've, I've delivered, delivered the punchline. Punch now I wait. And while it has never been published, <laughs> we can guess at its contents. And also reflect on just how much our favorite game designers really did struggle with names. Kuntz included a magical object that appeared to be a rusted sphere made of interlocking bands of iron that could be thrown at a target to magically hogtie them. And it was called the Iron Bands of Binding. Yeah, okay. And it was called another tick there. I'm surprised you can't hear that. They stand out to me like a sore thumb. But then I've been doing this a while, so experience, I guess. Called the Iron Bands of Finding. Find. 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 I've lost the front of that B, but I think it'll come back once we EQ. Bands of Finding. <clears throat> uh huh. That's recording me having a drink. By the way, in case you haven't picked up on it, we're now four minutes shorter than we were in the original file. Eleven years later, when the object saw print, it was renamed. Eleven years later, when the object saw print, it was renamed to the Iron Bands of Billaro, with one L. Why? Well, most such magical... Why? Why? Mm -hmm. Right there. See the mark? It's... it's... How do I explain this? Most of the audio runs left to right. Right, okay, and even though each given vertical slice represents a unique sound, most of the audio, when you look at it in this bottom half here, tends to go left to right, all right? So when there's a noise, something that jumps out at you as being wrong, it looks Sharply, sharply vertical, vertical and, not and not so much, so much left to right. right. So right, right here, here. That, yeah, there's a little, and I realize putting the white, white over it makes it weird. weird, makes it hard to see. But right, but right there, there, when I take it away, away watch that spot, there's a hard, hard line. line. That's, what That's what we don't want. want. That's, That's the noise. noise. See, it's see, gone, gone now. now. Why? Well, most such magical objects and spells were named in the fictional world of D&D &D after their creators. I don't think I like that take. Well, most such magical objects and spells were named in the fictional world of D&D &D after their creators. But that, but that's in the fiction of the game world. Okay. Whoops. Well, most such magical objects and spells were named in the fictional world of D&D &D after their creators. But then... Okay. So we keep this one. Get rid of this one over here. Why? Well, most... Why? Well, most such magical objects and spells were named in the fictional world of D&D &D after their creators. But then... But that's in the fiction... Okay, that's no good. So get rid of that creators. But that's in the fiction of the game world. In the real world, most of the proper names in D&D &D are references to characters played by the original is to characters played is to characters played to characters played <laughs> Right there.
characters played yep. by the original designers and testers of the game. For example, Dromage's instant summons was named after Jim Ward's character Dromage. And Odaluke's resilient sphere was named after Otis, Luke Gygax's player character in the Temple of Elemental Evil. See how this works? Well, Robert J. Kuntz played a character named Robolar for many years. And when TSR designers finally immortalized the magical object known as the Iron Bands of Billero, they wanted to recognize its original creator, Robert J. Kuntz. But their sense of fictional... Wow. Why could I do that? ...original creator, Robert J. Kuntz. Hmm. Weird. Robert J. Kuntz. Still weird. Robert J. Kuntz. Kuntz. Hmm. <laughs> Let's take that away. And away. Kuntz. Kuntz. Mm. <clears throat> Not going to be a lot of fixing that. Jay Kuntz. Kuntz. Hmm. I need to soften that. How do we go about softening it? Uh, this won't work. But we'll try it. See what happens. Oh, that's actually better. Okay. Get rid of that hard stop. Okay. Robert J. Kuntz. Yeah, that's Their better. sense of fictional consistency created a problem. Robolar was a fighter. He didn't make magical items. So they shuffled the letters of Robolar. Problem. Robolar. Yeah. Problem. Robolar was a fighter. He didn't make magical items. Hmm. Robolar was a fighter. He didn't make magical items. So they shuffled the letters of Robolar around and got Billero. Which is why the original name only had one L. Which is why the original name... It's hiding from me, but there it is. <clears throat> Which is why the original name only had one L. Which is why the original name only had one L. Only had. Yeah, the tick, tick right there. there. Which is why the original name only had one L. Better. Now, these sorts of word games were actually very common. For example, you might notice that Oda Luke is pretty much just a mashup of Otis and Luke, because it recognized Luke's character, Otis. And Dromage is just a reverse of the letters in Jim Ward's name. Tensor was Ernie Gygax's character, or rather, Ernest Gygax. It's just a letter scramble. We could spend hours going through these sorts of word games in D&D, honestly. Even the demon B2 in the classic adventure Keep on the Borderlands is just a slightly altered pronunciation of... Whoops. Whoops. Did you hear that? In the classic adventure Keep on the Borderlands is just a slightly altered pronunciation... Hear that right there? Altered... 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 Altered pronunciation... Got it now? Uh huh. That's a problem. We fix these one at a time. Yep. Oh, 
altered. There it is. All gone. <clears throat> slightly altered pronunciation of the module series code. It was module B. Two. But these sorts of word game. Bad start. But these sorts of word games are actually. Two. But these sorts of word games are actually much older than D and D. In some cases, they are as old as written language. Take, for example, Odaluk. Odaluk is an example of a portmanteau. That's a word made by combining the sounds of two or more words. Sometimes, as in Microsoft, it's two combined words, microcomputer and software, that create a new proper name. Sometimes, as in brunch, it's two combined words, breakfast and lunch, that create a new concept or word. But sometimes, as in tofurkey, <coughs> oh, oh, hey. And sometimes... Had a, had a sneezel, or a coughle, or one of them two. They create a new concept or word. And sometimes, as in Tufurki... Short net concept silence. Or word. And sometimes, as in Tufurki... And sometimes... As in to re-emphasizing to get the right read, create a new concept or word. And sometimes, as in tofurki, it's two combined words, tofu and turkey, that create something disgusting and ruin a wonderful holiday like Thanksgiving. Interestingly, though, portmanteau refers to luggage. Is that really interesting? Interestingly, though, for... Do people not know that? Giving. Interestingly, though, portmanteau used to refer to luggage. It came from two French words, porter and manteau. Porter. 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 It's there. A little tick. It's right there. Air. Yep, yep, that's good. And manto, which come from the same roots as words like portable and mantle, because it means to carry a cloak or to carry. Mm -mm. Because it means to carry a cloak or coat. But then, in 1871, Lewis Carroll decided that it needed a different meaning, which was part of the joke. See, in the sequel to Alice in Wonderland, which was called Through the Looking Glass, Alice encounters a poem. Alice encounters a poem. Alice encounters a looking glass. Mm -mm. Encounters, encounters, encounters a right there. See that See big, big blob, blob right, right there? there? Runs vertically, vertically. in amongst, in amongst these, these horizontal, horizontal runs. runs. That blob, blob is, that is that noise. noise. And now yeah, it's, it's gone. gone. Alice encounters a poem that she can't understand. The Jabberwock. It seems to contain a bunch of nonsense words. Words like slithy and mimsy. The poem itself is comprehensible. It's the story. The poem itself is comprehensible. Mm -hmm. Another tick. It's the story of a hero who goes off to slay a terrible monster named the Jabberwock. And he lops off its head with a vorpal sword. But vexed by the too long. 
head with a vorpal sword. But vexed by the poem. But vexed by the. So I got two pops in there. Vexed by. Vexed by but vexed by the. But vexed by the poem. Alice asks. Just gonna take, take one because the first one doesn't matter. Alice asks the character Humpty Dumpty about it. And Humpty Dumpty has some peculiar ideas about how language works. Ideas about how ling ideas about how mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the pop. Ideas about how language works. While he doesn't quite speak gibberish, he does insist that words mean precisely what he says they mean, even if they aren't very while he doesn't I already know I have two takes of this. So I'm just going to go get it. There. Language works. While he doesn't quite speak gibberish, he does insist that words mean precisely what he says they mean, even if they very clearly don't. Very clearly don't. They very clearly. They very. Right there. They very clearly clearly it's actually right there in that shadow. Anywhere else I wouldn't have messed with it probably. Wouldn't even have noticed. They very clearly don't. He explains that Slithy don't. He explains that Slithy. He explains. He explains that Slithy is a combination of. He explains that Slithy. He explains. I hate, I hate correcting, correcting a thing. I then take out for a different take. Is a combination of. He explains that slight. He explains. And then have the one I keep be worse. God, listen to all the problems there. Come on, mush mouth. He explains. He explains that. He explains that slithy. He explains that slithy is a combination of slimy and lithe. And Mimsy is miserable and flimsy. And thus he says, they are like portmanteaus, two meanings packed into one word. What's the logic there? Well, a portmanteau was a specific type of suitcase made of two equally sized halves joined together and closed. Like a clamshell. Like a clam There's a CH hiding in there that doesn't need to be there. Like a clamshell. There. Two halves made whole. And that word Clamshell, two halves made whole, and that word, two halves made whole. Right. Two halves made whole, and that. I like that better. Two halves made whole, two halves made whole, and that word. Take that away. Two halves made whole. And that word, the result of gibber. It's going to auto heal that so it doesn't have a hard edge. Two halves made whole. 
And that word, the result of gibberish wordplay to make some clever point about pseudo-intellectual literary scholars inventing jargon to elevate themselves over the uneducated This gets masses. redone. Because it's like nine <clears throat> sentences all in one. And that word, the result of gibberish... So that was a point that said it way back here. ...made whole. And that word, the result... Dang it. I hate that. ...made whole. And that word... The result of gibberish wordplay to make some clever point about pseudo-intellectual literary scholars inventing jargon to elevate themselves over the uneducated masses. Yeah. Uneducated. Bunch of, bunch of clicks and pops. Uneducated. There's one. There's two. Fixing those, so I re-listen. Elevate themselves over the uneducated masses. Generally better. In the term that lingu- <laughs> Yeah. It's, it's hard to do when you're maintaining a rhythm and a pace to get a really super long sentence to fit in that rhythm and pace. Without having to stop somewhere in the middle and check your red signs. There was less many jargon to elevate themselves over the uneducated masses. Came the term that linguistic scholars used to describe a word made by combining two others, which sort of proved Carol's point. But we digress. Word game. Portmanteaus aren't new. The word for them is recent, but new words have been appearing as a combination of old words forever, so Odaluk wasn't breaking any new wordplay ground. But neither were Dromage and Tensor and Robilar and Billaro. They were all examples of a very old form of word game known as the anagram. An anagram is a word. Now I have to explain anagram to you on the weird off chance that you've never heard the word before. Can't just throw it out there and leave it alone. Pardon me while I stretch a bit. All right. Good news, we're halfway through. Technically speaking, if if I'm looking at a regular length, we've got about 10 minutes of audio left. Unfortunately, that 10 minutes of audio is another 16 minutes. <laughs> so six minutes are going to have to disappear somewhere. Yes, I can just see Scott and I trying to educate small children. That, that seems like a bad idea. I don't know. Maybe. I mean, they're gamers. We're pretty close to children in some cases. Not you guys, of course. Word game known as the anagram. An anagram is a word or phrase. Okay. That's a significant pause. It does not need to be significant. It can be shorter. An anagram is a word or phrase made by rearranging the letters of a different word or phrase. And to really be proper, each letter should be used, and each should be used exactly once. And anagrams appear all throughout pop culture, not just in Dungeons & Dragons' name. For example, most people will recall that... To ah, you heard that, right? Will recall, will recall, will recall... How can you not hear that? Sounds like a man choking on a herringbone. You'll recall that Tarm... Oh, oh good. good. For example, most people will recall... For example... Dungeons and Dragons name. For example... Most people will recall that Tom Marvolo Riddle revealed his anagrammatic pseudonym 
<clears throat> yep. For example, most people will recall. <laughs> For example, most people will recall that Tom Marvolo. See, that's the way, that's it, way works. it works. If you, you get, get stuck, stuck doing, doing it the quick, quick easy, easy way. way. You stop, you stop, you slow, slow down, down, you formalize and enunciate. Name. For example, most people will recall... ...and Dragon's name. For example, most people will recall that Tom Marvolo Riddle revealed his... Okay. Now, now this, this part... part ...and Dragon's name. For example... Sounds, sounds way different than that second part. part. So, oh, we have we to do something. Do something. Uh, and, and the easiest thing to do to break up two different delivery styles, styles is to put, put some, some space between them. them. In this, In case, this case, we want to insert, insert a little, little silence. silence. So go over, go over to edit, edit insert, insert, silence. silence. And it says, so how, how long, long would you like this silence to be? Uh, two seconds. 2.013 seconds, seconds exactly. exactly. Okay. okay, there it is. Dragon's name. For example. No, yeah, I don't I really need it that long. long. But, but we are going, going to take, to take it, it um, down, down a bit. A bit. Dragon's name. For example, yeah, it yeah, still, still sounds, sounds, you know what, what? I, could I could actually, actually do this, this different. Uh, let's go back to here. Dungeons and Dragons name. For example. Nope. nope. One more back. In case you haven't noticed, noticed, over in the bottom, bottom left, left is your history. history. And it and lists, lists all the all things, things you've done, done to your audio. audio. And you can, you can backtrack, backtrack by picking any one of those. those. And it'll just, it'll, it'll replace, replace all the edits, edits you've done, done to, to that point, point and then leave you with that last edit. So. Dungeons and Dragons name. For example. I'm going to keep that for example. And then I'm going to go over here and I'm going to get rid of that. And that's going to be brilliant. I think. Is that what I want to do? For example. Oh, yes. That's, that's what I want to do. There. 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 Delete. Not just in Dungeons and Dragons name. For example. Most people will. That's a little better. Dungeons and Dragons name. For example. Most people will recall that Tom Marvolo better, Riddle better. revealed Much better. his anagrammatic suit anagrammatic Oh, oh you dummy. Why? 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 For example, <laughs> most people will recall that Tom Marvolo Riddle revealed his anagrammatic pseudonym when he said, I am Lord Voldemort. Oh, and then I get hung up on that. Okay. okay. All right. All right. We'll get there. I know because eventually I said words after that. And anagrams appear. For example, in Dungeons and Dragons name. For example, most people will recall that Tom Marvolo Riddle revealed his anagrammatic pseudonym when he said, "I am Lord Voldemort." Because and I, I talk, talk like, like a computer. computer. I am Lord. Vol I am Lord Voldemort. When he said, for example, most people will recall that Tom Marvolo Riddle revealed his anagrammatic pseudonym when he said, I am Lord Voldemort. Okay. okay. I don't know how many how takes, takes that, that was, was, but we got, we got a good one eventually. eventually. For example, in his name. There. Dungeons and Dragons name. For example, most people will recall that Tom Marvolo Riddle revealed his anagrammatic pseudonym when he said, I am Lord Voldemort. And classic rock fans of a certain age will remember, I am Lord Voldemort. And classic rock fans of a certain age will remember, 
Mr. Mojo Ryzen. Fans of a certain age will remember Mr. Mo. Mr. Mo I don't know if I, I did this twice or not, twice or not, but there's a pop there, and I want to get rid of it in case. <laughs> Mojo. Joe. Certain age will remember Mr. Mojo Ryzen from the hit song L.A. Woman by the nope. Doors. Did that twice. Mm -mm. And we've left out a word. Oh, that's, oh, that's why. why. And classic rock. For example, most people will. Yeah. Yep. And classic rock fan. Mm hmm. There we go. Try it again. again. Pseudonym when he said, I am Lord Voldemort. And classic rock fan. Where's, Where's that, that tick, tick come from? And classic. Wow, that's, that's a snap. And classic. And cla okay. And classic rock fans of a certain age will remember that Mr. Mojo Ryzen from the hit song L.A. Woman by The Doors was actually an anagram of the band singer-songwriter's name who we hope we don't have to name. There was a long pause written in here. It's Jim Morrison, Philistines. We hope we don't have to name. That's long enough. Who we hope we don't have to name. It's Jim Morrison, Philistines. But anagrams go back a lot further than that. And they have been used by some very smart people to do more than simply hide clever self-references in pop culture works. For example, as far back as the 4th century BC, they were being used to flatter the wealthy. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. That's what they were doing. For example, as far back as the... Decided, decided to do, to do a, a totally different read. read. For example. For example. For example. The example on forum. Self references in pop culture works. For example, as far back as the 4th century BC, they were being used to flatter the wealthy and the powerful. Greek poet Lycophron. Lycophron? Lycophron. Greek poet Lycophron was said. Yeah. yeah. Don't, know. Don't know. Didn't look, Didn't it, look up. it up. Wealthy and the powerful. To flatter the wealthy and the powerful. Greek poet Lycophron was said to be a master of this. The idea was simple. You take someone's name and rearrange the letters to spell out a complimentary word or phrase. One of the best examples of this actually comes from a 1994 Simpsons episode called Lisa's Rival. This actually comes from a 19... This actually comes from a... Hmm. Comes from a Give a little whistle. I don't... I might not be able to fix that. This actually comes from a 1994 Simpsons episode called... Episode... Called Lisa's rival. The brainy know-it-all Lisa Simpson befriends a girl who she is vexed to discover is smarter than her, and who comes from a very smart family. And one game that family plays regularly is an anagram game wherein they challenge each other to create anagrams for celebrities. Lisa's rival is challenged with Alec Guinness, a classy English actor, and she comes up with the anagram Genuine Class. Lisa, meanwhile, is stumped with Jeremy Irons and can Jeremy Irons. Mm -hmm. Right there. Little pip pop pop. And it's gone. Stumped with Jeremy Irons and can only say. But it comes back. Yes. And can only. Right, where are you? And can. Oh. It'd be that big spike right there. Sometimes it's not so obvious down here in the bottom half, but when you zoom out a bit, 
you can see right where it is in the top half. See that big sharp jump? That's a click. Big broad click. One that took time. And can only say, hmm. And can only, can only, can only, yeah, that right there. Goodbye. And can only, nope. can only, still haven't got it all. Hmm. Sometimes you just got to do that, track it down. You see how it starts smooth and it ends relatively smooth. There's a big messy jumble right in here. All kinds of ups and downs and sub ups and downs. That's the noise right there. So we just highlight auto heal. Now it looks better. Not perfect. It'll never be perfect, but it's better. And can only say Jeremy's irony rather than the slightly more esoteric Rim Enjoyers. This sort of game... Another, another punchline we'll just leave hanging out there over the end. It'll be fine. Nobody will complain. This sort of game... Okay. Only say Jeremy's irony, rather than the slightly more esoteric Rim enjoyers. This sort of game of rearranging names to find some complimentary descriptor evolved and took a little <laughs> bit of the mouth. This sort of game. Uh, revealing all my professional secrets. Here we go. This sort of game of rearranging names to find some complimentary descriptor evolved and took on a messed up little of food and nerd and I heard near here. <laughs> right. <clears throat> this sort of game of rearranging. Take a break. Step, step back. back. This sort of game of. Start again. again. This sort of game of rearranging names to find some complementary descriptor evolved and took on a mystical significance. By the Roman days, anagrams were believed to have prophetic or mystical significance. Didn't, didn't like, like the fact, fact that, that I had, had to say, say uh, significance, significance twice, twice in the same, same sentence. sentence. That was not happy. happy. Mm. Excuse me. Anagrams are named in half. Now I gotta go fix it. So I fix it in the script. <laughs> okay, let's try that this way. Okay, so now I come all the way back. This sort of game. This sort of game of rearrangement. Dream enjoyers. Right. right. This sort of game of rearranging names to find some complementary descriptor evolved and took on a mystical aspect. By the Roman days, anagrams were believed to have prophetic or mystical significance. Jewish Kabbalists, who, Jewish Kabbal, Jewish Kabbalists. There we go. Jewish. I know how to say, say words. words. Really, I do. do. Prophetic or mystical significance. Jewish Kabbalists would see. Uh, there's a weirdness there, so I'm going to get rid of that. Just a artifact weirdness from the trim. Prophetic or mystical significance. Jewish Kabbalists would seek hidden meanings inside people's names, believing them to be hidden messages from God. And Christian biblical scholars would use anagrams to hide hidden meanings in the text. One of the most famous examples of a biblical... Another tick. Right there. One of the most famous examples. One of the most. One of the most. One of the most. One of the most. 
Hmm. One of the most. The most. One of the most famous examples of a biblical anagram, though it came out a bit later, involves the confrontation between Jesus Christ and the Roman governor Pontius Pilate. As Pilate conducts Jesus' trial, Jesus claims to speak the truth. Pilate challenges him by suggesting there is no absolute truth. What is truth, he demands. Or in Latin, quid est veritas. Jesus, in the Bible, remains silent. But ancient scholars suggested the answer was an anagram of the question. Est verqui adest. Which translates to, it is the man who stands before you. Which... Just tells me biblical, biblical scholars have way too much time on their hand. After the decline of Rome, anagrams fell. Okay, how long is that pause? It is the man who stands before you. No, too long. Which translates to, it is the man who stands before you. After the decline of Rome, anagrams fell out of favor for a long time. But then later... This needs a silence. And a trim, maybe. Long time. Yeah. Long time. But then language and clever wordplay weren't exactly popular. <laughs> Too many tongues. After the decline of Rome, anagrams fell out of favor. After the decline, that's just the way it is, folks. Sometimes you got to be a little weird to get through things. Which translates to, "It is the man who stands before you." After the decline of Rome, anagrams fell out of favor for a long time, but then. Language and clever wordplay weren't exactly popular in the Dark Ages, as civilization was recovering from basically collapsing. But they did enjoy a resurgence in popularity in the late Middle Ages, especially among scientists, scholars, and alchemists who wanted to hide their discoveries from prying eyes, especially from the Christian Church. One of the more famous examples... Mm. One of the more... That's a double cracker. One right there. And one right there, I think. Yeah. One of the more famous examples of such an anagram was when Galileo Galilei sent a string of letters that is too long to read and impossible to pronounce. But when unscrambled read, I have obs... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, bless me. me. But when unscrambled read... But when unscrambled red... Go in here and look at this. Make sure. Okay, it looks pretty good. Impossible to pronounce. But when unscrambled red, I have observed the most distant planets to have triple form. That was referring to his obs... Okay, why did I wait so long? Nobody knows. Triple form. That was referring to his observations that other planets had objects like moons in orbit around them, implying that not everything in the universe was in direct orbit around the Earth. Okay, good to know. Important stuff. Later still, in the 19th century, the universe was in direct orbit around the Earth. Later still, in the 19th century, the game... 19th century... Hmm. Bad juju. The interlaced ones, and by interlaced I mean they're like sitting right under the speech. 
The interlaced ones are hard to do, but if you're careful and patient, it should be easy enough. You just, and the nice thing is, you can zoom in as far as you need to. It's just, you take it in, you know. Oh, look, now it doesn't mean anything. It's just a smear of information. No, you can take it in as near and as far as you need to in order to get the appropriate detail level to be able to work on something. I generally find that is about right for most things. And then I just zoom in where I need to. Later still, in the 19th century, the game of celebrity... Basically... Every every half second is is up here. That's my usual working level. Okay, so there's 20 minutes, 38 and a half seconds, 20 minutes, 39 seconds, 20 minutes, 39 and a half. Okay, just like that. In the 19th century, the game of celebrity became all the rage, hearkening back to the poets of ancient Greece. Basically, this was the origin of the anagram game that Lisa Simpson just couldn't get the hang of. But anagrams aren't the only form of flatteringly poetic word game. To yeah, of, had to rewrite this too. <laughs> Let's try this again. Oh. But anagrams aren't the only form of flatteringly worded poetry. Game. Yeah, this was a toughie. There we go. Game. Let's try this again. But anagrams aren't the only form of flatteringly poetic word game. And I think, I think it, goes it goes to about there. there. We'll see. Did I get it right? Did I get it wrong? The hang of. But anagrams aren't the only. This was the origin of the anagram game that Lisa Simpson just couldn't get the hang of. But anagrams aren't the only form of flat. Okay, trim that a little. Lisa Simpson just couldn't get the hang of. But anagrams aren't the only form of flatteringly worded poetry game to come to us from ancient Greece and gain popularity in the Middle Ages and beyond. Another example is the acrostic poem. Acrostic is a portmanteau of two Greek words that mean topmost verse. Essentially, an acrostic is a multi-line verse where the first letter in each line spells out something. The oldest form, the oldest form, again, was spelling out something. Each line spells out something. The oldest form, again, was spelling out someone's name. And that was an especially popular way to pay respect to a patron or a saint during the Middle Ages. To give an easy, to give an easy to find example. Yeah, yeah so, so easy, easy I couldn't easy even say it. it. As you will see. Lages. To give an easy to find example, we'll go back to Lewis Carroll. The first letter of each line in the last chapter of Through the Looking Glass. Mm -hmm. Botched, Botched it. it. First letter of each. The first letter. To give an easy to find example, we'll go back to Lewis Carroll. The first letter of each line in the last chapter. Sounds ticky. First letter. Yeah. yeah. First letter of each. Mm -mm, still ticky. That's the first letter. You get all those at once. First letter of there each line in the last chapter of Through the Looking Glass spells out the name of the real Alice on which the fictional Alice was based. Alice Pleasance Little. In fact, the books were the result of stories that Lewis Carroll, whose real name was Charles Dodgson, which is not an anagram, told the ten-year-old Little during a boating and picnic trip. And there are lots of other word games, too. But true masters of word... <laughs> there are lots of other word games, too. Thanks.
somewhere. It's made with lots of other word games, too. There are lots of other words. made with us already. And there are lots of other word games, too. There are lots of other word games, too. Oops. Oops. Good thing I double checked, I would have left that in. Then he'd all wondered what happened. Why did Brian go crazy right at the end? Ten year old little during a boating and picnic trip. There are lots of other word games. Feels too long. There are lots. And there's a tick in it right there. There we go. A boating and picnic trip. There are lots of other word games too. But true masters of wordplay don't stop at one game. And that leads us to one of the oldest recorded and most famous of all word games in history. The Sator Square. The Sator Square combines elements of acrostics, anagrams, and a palindrome. A phrase that reads the same forward or backwards. It is a five by... Oh. Excuse me. <laughs> what a pig. <laughs> forward or backwards. It is a five by five grid of letters, five lines, each consisting of a single five letter word. You can read it left to right and top to bottom, or you can read it right to left and bottom to top. Originally, the Sator Square, originally, the <laughs> originally, and bottom to top. Originally, the Sador Square was thought to be an invention of clever Christian scholars created in the 4th century CE. But an example of it has now been found on the ruined walls of Pompeii, and it appears to have been inscribed in about 8... Mm -hmm. And it appears to... Mm -hmm. Don't know, oh, just ran out. out. And it appears... the ruined walls of Pompeii, and it appears to have been inscribed in about 80 CE. It reads, if you're curious, Sador... Yeah, 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 yeah. that's how it's we how it to reads. It's, uh, it's all words. They're all Greek to me. It reads, if you're curious, Sador Arepo... Nope. It reads, if you're curious, Sador Arepo tenet... Ar nope. It reads, if you're... Getting closer. It reads, if... And it appears to a bunch of bad takes in there. I won't burden you with them. Arepo? Nope. It reads, if you're curious, Sator Arepo Tenet Apera Rhodus. Translation. It reads, if... and it appears... There. Yeah, there. What was that all about? walls of Pompeii, and it appears to have been inscribed in about 80 CE. It reads, if you're curious, Sator Arepo Tenet Apera Rhodus. Translation, the gardener Arepo holds and works the plow. Hmm. The word play is admittedly too long. Get to the punchline. The gardener Arepo holds and works the plow. Too long. Holds and works the plow. The word play is admittedly more exciting yeah, yeah. than the actual translation. But go look at the thing. It's a pretty cool little bit of linguistic gymnastics. Kind of makes the Robolara Bolaro thing pale by comparison, doesn't it? Speaking of that, we should note that although Billaro was an emigrant. Speaking of that, we should note that although Bill. Mm, 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 mm. Speaking of that, we should note that all getting close, close almost, almost to the end. Play is admittedly more exciting than the actual translation, but go look at the thing. Speaking of that, the Robolara Bolaro thing pale by comparison, doesn't it? Speaking of that, we should note that although Billaro was an anagram of Robolar made to pay homage to the Magic Items author, Rob Kuntz, by remembering his original D&D &D character, 
Rob himself was so bad at naming his character that he couldn't even come up with a bit of clever wordplay. The name Robilar has nothing to do with his own name, Rob. In fact, after Kuntz created the character, he couldn't come up with a name. Eager to start the game, Gary Gygax reportedly dubbed him Robilar after a gnome in a short story Gygax was writing at the time. Hmm. All of that said, to him. Come back. Big guy Gax was writing at the time. All of that said, we should also note that the Warbo, who originally suggested this topic, the Warbo's online handle is itself a result of accidental wordplay that directly involved the writer of this very script. See, Matt the Warbo is actually Matthew Arbo. And his online handle was just his first and last name with no spaces. And he's given us permission to tell this story, by the way. But due to a miss... But due to a miss... Mm-hmm. ...to tell this story, by the way. But due to a misreading of his name during an online charity live stream, we accidentally dubbed him Matt the Warbo. As if a Warbo was a thing, and Matt was an example of one. And the name stuck. Because really, don't all game... Nope. nope. That's, That's not a good take. And the name stuck. Because really... And the name stuck. Because really, don't all gamers love clever word game? No, nope, that's, that's a bad, a bad take, take too. too. And the name stuck. Because really, don't all gamers love clever word games? Even accidental ones? There we, there go. we go. Don't need the rest, the rest of, that. of that. Tail out's, tail out's not important. important. Okay. okay, so that's, so that's the, the script, script part. part. Of the, of the episode, episode edited. edited and it now looks like that and comes in at 24 minutes and 46, 24 minutes and 46 seconds, seconds down, down from its original, original 36. 36 aren't i good um well, please remember to save your changes. changes there you go all saved now, now we still, we still have a problem, problem here. here i want my audio, audio to look, to look nice, nice. Because by looking nice, it will also sound nice. There's a couple ways to do this. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's easy to hear the closing music once you know the patterns. Uh, anyway, one of the ways to make it look nice is to first get it to sound all about the same level. And there's a lovely little thing over here in Adobe Audition called Match Loudness. See it right here? Right here, right there? Mm -hmm. Match Loudness, got that? Yeah, yeah, okay. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the file, I'm gonna grab a hold of it, and I'm gonna drag it down here to where it says Match Loudness. Okay? And I've already got some things set up. Uh, this is what I want it Hmm, is that what I want it to do? I don't think that's what I want it to use. That's weird. Okay, anyway. Um, man, I wish they wouldn't change everything every time they update something. Okay, so I've got it set up here to match loudness to a particular standard. This is a European standard. What it amounts to is overall the file should at no point be louder than what they call minus 23 loudness units something or other okay it's what it means is it's the way your ear actually hears this is much better at matching it appropriately so anyway we're gonna drop the file in here uh, we don't have to do much except select that and run it and it will take a few minutes because it looks at the whole file and says, okay, what do we got going on here? Then it decides, what do I have to do to make all this stuff match the way it's supposed to match? 
And if you watch this as it runs, when it gets to the end, it will, you'll see the change, what it's done. Okay, so it's a pretty subtle change because uh, we were pretty close just because I'm generally pretty good at getting that lined up. Uh, the number we want to look at is right here at loudness. It's an average of minus 22.25 decibels, okay, which you will hear as minus 16.32 decibels, which is good. It's a good place for it to be. Nothing is louder than that. But I do one other thing, but I don't do it here. This file we are done with. Done with that file. So we save it. That's the way it's going to be. I know I'm done because none of the peaks are running off the chart and it's not under loud anywhere else. <coughs> Excuse me, again. All right. Now I have to make a show out of it, because that's just raw audio, and it's not very exciting. So I go to multi-track, because I'm going to have multi-tracks. Some are going to be me talking. Some are going to be the music. That kind of stuff. Go. I'm going to go grab another drink. Be right back. Okay, so I got a cough drop while I was at it. That would probably help. Maybe. So, the other big secret. How does the whole thing get stuck together? Well, first thing I do is I make some tracks. Just like, Just like that. that. Okay? okay? Now, now I, know I know some things, things about, about the tracks, tracks I need to make. make. Um, uh, first off, I know I only need three. three. So I go in and I get rid of some of these extras. And then I can make that fill up the space better. All right. I don't generally have to do anything to this track, this first one up here. This one here um, could be a little tricky, but I know what I want. 
is I'm going to have my voice in there. So I have a graphic equalizer. It's all set up already. It's saved in there under my name. So I just add it. You see it pops up right there. Uh, and for this, I don't need anything else. I know the music, I'm going to automatically take that down uh, quite significantly. So it lays under uh, the narration properly. Okay. And here is where I put my other uh, volume adjustment, I guess is what we're going to call it. And that is a hard limiter. And it's going to limit all the audio, so none of it, when it comes out the other end, none of it is above six decibels. Or minus six decibels. And this is the master track, so it's going to do that to all of the other tracks to make sure it all comes out right. Isn't that nice? Okay, so first I need to go get the bumper bits, the... Uh, The open and close, basically. There they are. And I start just by throwing the opening in there, all right? You'll all recognize that as soon as it plays, all right? This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. Neat, huh? Okay. Now. I grab the recorded part I've done and I slide it in here. Now normally, or usually I suppose I should say, a little chime, you know, you know how this works. That chime happens near the last syllable of the title of the episode. But this is some ridiculous long title he's come up with here. So we gotta play with it a bit. Iron Bands of Bellaro. And surprisingly, I got it about right. Okay. okay. Iron Bands of Bellaro. So this is our whole opening. Let's hear what we've got. This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. Iron Bands of Bellaro. Not bad. It will probably come as no surprise that we here at the Word of the Week love word games. And you notice I sound about a hundred times better. My voice is filled in. That's the graphic equalizer doing its job. <clears throat> After all, each one of our episodes is basically just a running game of free association. Okay. So, I want to bring, for this episode, I want to bring in audio right after the chime. Or, uh, music. Right after the chime. Now, hopefully this bit works properly. Um... Okay, we're going to go to I type well. I uh, have been using these guys a lot because they're quite good. They've been background music for about a year now. But I need to figure out what I want this episode to sound like. It's nothing too heavy. It's not like Cthulhu or werewolves or anything like that. It's just a nice, fun discussion about word games, basically. Nobody's getting murdered. There's no war. None of that kind of stuff. So we can go light. So I'm going to start by taking optimistic as a mood. That's the nice thing about their website is they can you can choose by mood and instruments and all kinds of different stuff. All right. And then I'm going to see what they have to offer here. Hmm. Let's take. Yeah, we'll take mid energy. See where that gets us.
Mm -hmm. Very nice, nice tune. tune. Not, Not enough energy. energy. For, where we're, for where we're going. So we'll go high energy. Oh yeah. I like that. That works good. Okay. So that is Blue Dot Sessions. Uh, Lord Weasel off the Mole Rider album. Now you're thinking to yourself, what's that going to get me? Well, what it's going to get me is into here. Blue Dot Sessions. Mole Rider is here. And Lord Weasel is there. I generally like about three, sometimes four minutes for song length. So this will work. I've got it. So I can go back over here. I go there. I can go to there. Lord Weasel. And that brings it in. <clears throat> okay. okay, cool, huh? Cool, huh? And, I and I just grab, grab it, it and put it about, about where I want things, things to start. start. The other nice the thing, thing is, is I can, can I click it, it and I can go over here to the right, the right hand, hand panel, panel essential sound. sound. Tell it it's music. music. Tell it that I want, I want it to be balanced, balanced background music. music. And it and will automatically, automatically adjust a level. level to set it underneath everything. So let's see what we got. This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. Iron Bands of Bellaro. It will probably come as no surprise that we here at the Word of the Week love word games. After all, each one of our episodes is basically just a running game of free association. Which is why one of our favorite pieces of poetry contains the following lines. The time has come, the walrus said, to talk of many things. Of shoes and ships and sealing wax, of cabbages and kings, and why the sea is boiling hot, and whether pigs have wings. We also, as we have mentioned before, love running down a good gaming mystery. For previous examples, see our episodes about the Cloak of the Mountebank and the elemental deity Kosuth. And when it comes to running down a good gaming mystery, there is no better source of mysteries than the names of various things in Dungeons and Dragons. Monsters, magical items, locations, and characters. See, for every bugbear in Malabranche that's a pretty direct reference to a piece of classical mythology, folklore, religion, or literature, there's at least two more Nistals and Blodgets that are references to such obscure things of personal interest to the authors of the game that no one in their right mind would ever know or recognize. And those actually far outnumber the Evards of the game that are just made up gibberish words. Or so claim the game's many creators. So in friend and supporter of the show... What? Nistal? Blodget? You want to know what those are references to? Okay, let's start with Blodget. To be fair, Blodgett doesn't appear to be a reference so much as a name stolen in desperation. Blodgett was a halfling thief who originally helped a party of heroes named Elweta, Ogre, Freda, Carraway, Dread Delgath, Fanstern, and Elgeus defeat the slave lords of Flinaeus. See, once upon a time, there was this series of Dungeons and Dragons adventure modules called the A series. At the time when TSR published modules, they would use letters and numbers to divide them into different series. The A series, later called the Scourge of the Slave Lords, consisted of four modules, A1 through A4, in which the heroes confronted some coastal raiders, discovered they were raiding on behalf of a massive slave ring, tracked the slavers to their lair beneath a volcanic island, and eventually escaped the dungeons of the Slave Lords. But before the modules were published and sold, 
They were created by TSR for use in a tournament at Gen Con 13 in 1980. Because they were tournament modules, they included a set of pre-generated characters that players would use to play through the module. The idea was basically that each group would take on the same modules with the same set of PCs, earn a score, and the party that scored the highest won. Which means the designers of the modules, David Cook, Alan Hammock, Harold Johnson, Tom Moldvay, Lawrence Schick, and Edward Carmian had to come up with a bunch of pre-generated characters and name them all. And naming characters was always a pain in the butt. Remember that. It'll be important later. See? See? How nice was that? Is that exactly, exactly what I'm looking for? It even ended in the right place. For example, we're pretty sure that the character LJS is actually just Lawrence Schick's initials. We can't say that categorically, though, because we can't find any reference to his middle name. And we looked. And as for Blodgett, in 1840. Okay. So we got a little space there. I've, I've given you a break from the last piece of music, which is important. And I want to pick up because we're going to tell a new story. Blodgett. And that's our intro. So I want to start the music right about there. So I'm going to go back here and see what I got. It's kind of an old timey story. Starts out old timey. Uh, let's go reflective. No, let's not do both at once. Now, let's go reflective. There we go. Um, that, um, particular that particular tune, tune should, should sound really familiar, because a lot of our episodes, episodes have that in it, uh, that particular tune. Yeah, I like that one. And I don't think I have this album already. By the way, yes, I have paid for all these. I have paid dearly for all these. <laughs> uh, okay, let's grab that. We come back here and... in and line her up about like so I think again tell it it's background music see where we, how we do and we looked and as for Blodgett in 1848 a Vermont tavern owner hired a local stove maker to build an oven for his tavern the stove maker was Gardner S. Blodgett, and he gained such a reputation for quality that soon he was making ovens for everyone. Today, Blodgett Corporation, the same company founded by that stove maker in 1848, 
is one of the biggest manufacturers of commercial ovens. And if you spend any time behind the counter in a pizza parlor anywhere in the United States, you've probably seen the name Blodgett scrawled across a pizza oven. Now, we fully admit that this could be a weird coincidence, but young gamers and youngish game designers spend a lot of time around pizza. So we're willing to bet it's a lifted name, especially because of how common that stuff is, as you'll soon see. Take our other example, Nistel. There are a bunch of magical spells in the D&D universe that are named after specific characters. Bigby's Crushing Hand, Melf's Acid Arrow, and Morden Kanan's Lucubration. Which is not, as we often misread it to our own embarrassment when we were finally corrected, Morden Kanan's Lubrication. Just to name a few. And they're all named after various characters from the early days of the game. Mostly they are named after the characters people played in the earliest Dungeons and Dragons games. But Nistel's magical aura was once unique in that it was the only spell in the game named after a living human person and not a game character. It's just not the living person most people think. The spell Nistel's magical aura allows a spellcaster to imbue a mundane object with a magical aura. In essence, it makes a normal, boring, everyday thing appear to be an exciting, magical thing. It's a scam spell, a con. You can pass off a normal object as magical. The spell originally appeared in the 1978 Advanced Dungeons and Dragons Player's Handbook. In 1995, a recently hired TSR employee named Mike Nistel claimed that the spell had, in fact, been named after him, and that he had the distinction of being the only real person for whom a spell had been named. This was in an article in Dragon Magazine, issue 219. Look it up. Mike claimed to have gotten started playing RPGs a decade prior, in 1985. Which means he had a spell named after him before he played the game? That seems kind of odd. Well, Gary Guy, about 90% of this work is serendipity. Uh, you have now seen it in action twice, where I have had music end exactly where it needs to be without any further adjustments on my part. That is, it's just luck, and that's the way it happens most of the time. He had a spell named after him before he played the game? That seems kind of odd. Well, Gary Gygax actually cleared up the confusion in a forum post years later. It turns out the spell was named for one Brad Nistel, a stage magician who had suggested the idea of the deceptive spell at Gen Con one year. Interestingly, though, a game designer named Len Lakovka said he ran a game for an entire clan of Nistels one time, including Brad, Jenny, Mike, and Brian. And Mike and Brian, who both went on to be game designers at TSR and FOSA respectively, admit their father got them into role-playing games and had worked in theater, lending credence to the idea that Brad Nistel may have been their father and Gary's account might be accurate. However, Mike insists to this day that it's his name, not his father's, on the spell. And we'll probably never know the truth. But we digress. The point is, the names in the Dungeons and Dragons universe... Okay. What do you... Hmm. Let me listen to that last bit. Mike insists to this day that it's his name, not his father's, on the spell. And we'll probably never know the truth. But we digress. The point is, the names in the Dungeons and Dragons universe are always great gaming fodder for a good, complicated mystery. And, as names like LJS suggest, they're also a great source of wordplay. So when friend and supporter of the show, The Warbo, suggested we explore the origins of the Iron Bands of Dolaro, a very old enchanted item from the earliest days of Dungeons & Dragons, we couldn't resist. And when we finally did figure out the mystery, we had a hearty laugh, because 
of all the people who could have suggested this particular topic, it was most appropriate coming from the Warbo. But we'll come back to that. Okay. Yeah, I yeah, thought, thought about, about putting, another putting another piece, piece in, in earlier, earlier, but no, no this, this is, is a better place. place. It's a better place. The Iron Bands of Billero. But we'll come back to that. There. Okay, so we're back to our topic. And... Don't need reflective. Go back to optimistic here. What do you think? Should I use that one? <laughs> wow. Uh, what's it do later on? Yeah, let's use it. Use it, use it, use it. Do I have it? Uh, little Rock. Hmm, kind of short, though. Um, we'll try it and see how far it gets us. I might have to change it. By the way, all, all I'm doing, doing to pull things, things in, in is in this, this file section, section up here, here, the little import, import file, file symbol, symbol, which you can also, also get to through the file menu. menu. Import. Okay, okay. Just, just this little guy. I go there. Go down sessions. Now I've forgotten where I was going. Well, we're at Little Rock, all right. Okay. And now it's loaded up in here. I just pull it over to where I want it. Which I think is going to be about there. You do this long enough, you kind of get a feel for where to place things, what sounds right and what doesn't. Great coming from the Warbo. But we'll come back to that. The Iron Bands of Billero are, or or the Iron Bands of Billero is, or, well, okay, so this is one of those tricky things where the item is singular but contains a plural in the name so the subject verb agreement is a pain and no matter how you try to say it, it doesn't sound natural and however you write it, you know your editor and producer is going to have an aneurysm and change it. So we're going to do this in the most clumsy but grammatically accurate way we can think of. The magical object known as the Iron Bands of Billero is are a sphere of entwined metal ribbons that, when thrown at a target and activated with an appropriate magic word, expand or expands and envelops the target, ultimately imprisoning him or her like a metal mummy. And if you're a fan of the Critical Role Live Play podcast, you might recognize that object as part of Vox Machina member Percival's arsenal. Percival, 
or more correctly, Lord Percival Frederick Stein von Musil Klausowski del Rolo III, lately of Whitestone, also chose not to deal with the whole issue of singular proper noun phrases with plural words by giving his object known as the Iron Bands of Billero a nickname. He calls it manners. Now, the Iron Bands of Billero are, or is, as we said, an old magic item, older than you might think, but not as old as we hoped. There's no great mythic story we could find that inspired the object. It appears that it's a D&D &D original, and the object known as the Iron Bands of Billero first appeared in the 1985 optional rules supplement Unearthed Arcana, or at least they first appeared there under that name. But they first appeared in Dungeons & Dragons 11 years earlier. In 1974, Robert J. Kuntz, friend to Gary Gygax and one of the original gamers who tested the very first version of D&D, Robert J. Kuntz designed a section of the sprawling underground complex known as Castle... Hmm, not sure I like that. At least not the way it ended. So what I'm going to do, and this is the way it works in the edition, Audition. Uh, I don't know about anybody else. I'm going to grab this little thing over here. And you can see it's labeled Fade Out. And I can shape it in a bunch of different ways. Basically, my objection is it doesn't run out soon enough. So I'm going to make it run out here. Uh, but I want it to do it fairly gradually. Let's see how that sounds unearthed arcana or at least they first appeared there under that name but they first appeared in dungeons and dragons 11 years earlier in 1974 robert j kuntz friend to gary gygax and one of the That's original better. gamers who tested the very first version of DD, &D, robert j kuntz designed a section of the sprawling underground complex known as castle greyhawk he named it the orc level and while it has never been published, we can guess at its contents. And also reflect on just how much our favorite game designers really did struggle with names. Kuntz included a magical object that appeared to be a rusted sphere made of interlocking bands of iron that could be thrown at a target to magically hogtie them. And it was called the Iron Bands of Binding. Eleven years later, when the object saw print, it was renamed to the Iron Bands of Billero with one L. Why? Well, most such magical objects and spells were named, in the fictional world of D&D, &D, after their creators. But that's in the fiction of the game world. In the real world, most of the proper names in D&D &D are references to characters played by the original designers and testers of the game. For example, Dromage's Instant Summons was named after Jim Ward's character Dromage. And Odaluk's Resilient Sphere was named after Otis, Luke Gygax's player character in the Temple of Elemental Evil. See how this works? Well, Robert J. Kuntz played a character named Robolar for many years. And when TSR designers finally immortalized the magical object known as the Iron Bands of Billero, they wanted to recognize its original creator, Robert J. Kuntz. But their sense of fictional consistency created a problem. Robolar was a fighter. He didn't make magical items. So they shuffled the letters of Robolar around and got Billero, which is why the original name only had one L. Okay. Let's, Let's see what see we can what do we next, next here. I don't even know what we're headed into next. Let's see here. Now, these sorts of word games were actually very... Right. right. More on commonalities of word games. Okay. So we can go back. Oops. Thank you. 
That gets way too big. Sounds way more sinister than it needs to be. That doesn't really fit. Presets. Now, I suspect I'll have to trim something on the front here. We'll see. Found and got Billero, which is why the original name only had one L. Now, these sorts of word games were actually very common. For yeah, example, you might notice that Oda Luke is pretty much just a mashup of Otis and Luke, because it recognized Luke's character, Otis. And Dromage is just a reverse of the letters in Jim Ward's name. Tensor was Ernie Gygax's character, or rather, Ernest Gygax. It's just a letter scramble. We could spend hours going through these sorts of word games in D&D, &D, honestly. Even the demon B2 in the classic adventure Keep on the Borderlands is just a slightly altered pronunciation of the module series code. It was module B2. But these sorts of word games are actually much older than D&D. &D. In some cases, they are as old as written language. Take, for example, Odaluk. Odaluk is an example of a portmanteau. That's a word made by combining the sounds of two or more words. Sometimes, as in Microsoft, it's two combined words 
microcomputer and software to create a new proper name. Sometimes, as in brunch, it's two combined words, breakfast and lunch, to create a new concept or word. And sometimes, as in tofurkey, it's two combined words, tofu and turkey, that create something disgusting and ruin a wonderful holiday like Thanksgiving. Interestingly, though, portmanteau used to refer to luggage. It came from two French words, porter and manteau, which come from the same roots as words like portable and mantle, because it means to carry a cloak or coat. But then, in 1871, Lewis Carroll decided that it needed a different meaning, which was part of the joke. See, in the sequel to Alice in Wonderland, which was called Through the Looking Glass, Alice encounters a poem that she can't understand. The Jabberwock. It seems to contain a bunch of nonsense words. Words like slithy and mimsy. The poem itself is comprehensible. It's the story of a hero who goes off to slay a terrible monster named the Jabberwock, and he lops off its head with a vorpal sword. But vexed by the poem, Alice asks the character Humpty Dumpty about it. And Humpty Dumpty has some peculiar ideas about how language works. While he doesn't quite speak gibberish, he does insist that words mean precisely what he says they mean, even if they very clearly don't. He explains that slithy is a combination of slimy and lithe, and mimsy is miserable and flimsy. And thus, he says, they are like portmanteaus, two meanings packed into one word. What's the logic there? Well, a portmanteau was a specific type of suitcase made of two equally sized halves joined together and closed. Like a clamshell, two halves made whole. And that worked. The result of gibberish wordplay to make some clever point about pseudo-intellectual literary scholars inventing jargon to elevate themselves over the uneducated masses came the term that linguistic scholars used to describe a word made by combining two others. Which sort of proved Carol's point. But we digress. Word games. Now, portmanteaus aren't new. The word for them hmm. is reason, but new words have been appearing as a combination of old words forever. So Odaluk wasn't breaking any new wordplay ground. Okay, okay. So, so sometimes, sometimes you get you serendipity, serendipity, and sometimes, and sometimes you get a you problem, problem you have, have to fix. fix. ...to others. Which sort of proved Carol's point. But we digress. Word games. All right. I want, I want this, this music, music to end there, but it doesn't, doesn't end there. It ends way over here. That's okay, because okay. I do this, and I just mouse over to the end of the song until that turns red. And then I drag the end of the song back where I want it, which is roughly there. But. That's going to sound, sound dumb. dumb. But we digress. Word games. Because it just stops. So, in order to fix that... Whoops. In order to fix that, we drag this fade over. Remember the fade. And I bend it down a little so it comes to a nice fade out starting about there. And we'll see what happens. Two others sort of proved Carol's point. But we digress. Word games. There you go. There you go. Now, pretty. pretty. Portmanteaus aren't new. The word for them is reason. But new words have been appearing as a combination of old words forever. So Odaluk wasn't breaking any new wordplay ground. But neither were Dromage and Tensor and Robilar and Billaro. They were all examples of a very old form of word game known as the anagram. An anagram is a word or phrase made by rearranging the letters of a different word or phrase. And to really be proper, 
Each letter should be used, and each should be used exactly once. And anagrams appear all throughout pop culture, not just in Dungeons and Dragons name. For example, okay. I feel like that's a really pointless ex explanation. Homage and Tensor and Robilar and Billaro. They were all examples of a very old form of word game known as the anagram. An anagram is a word or phrase made by rearranging the letters of a different... So I'm going to pick this up here and take this really boring explanation and put music under it. Yeah, Contabar, the, the equalizer is really nice. Um, a lot of people use the equalizer to... Add things to their voice that isn't normally there, like you get the, you know, the really, you know, really rumbly deep guys who think they're on radio and they have to sound like they're, you know, 70 feet tall. That is not the way I use the equalizer. Um, anybody who has actually met me, met me can tell you uh, I really do sound like that. I use the equalizer to put those pieces back in my voice that the microphone and the recording and all this other stuff have taken out. It's a frequency response thing with a microphone. I don't know if I said that earlier. That doesn't fit anything. That xylophone is way too present. It like draws your attention away from almost everything. Uh, otherwise, I'd use that.
Almost had me, but not quite. Actually, I think I like that one. Do I have it? <laughs> oh, you keep forgetting. Sweethearts. There, yeah, okay. Jet Pori. There we go. And it is there. And now it is here. Again, give it our preset. Bar and Billero. I just want to make sure. Linguistic scholars used it to flows. describe a word made by combining two others. It sort of proved Carol's point. But we digress. Word games. Now, portmanteaus aren't new. The word for them is recent. But new words have been appearing as a combination of old words forever. So Odaluk wasn't breaking any new wordplay ground, but neither were Dromage and Tensor and Robilar and Billaro. They were all examples of a very old form of word game known as the anagram. An anagram is a word or phrase made by rearranging the letters of a different word or phrase, and to really be proper, each letter should be used, and each should be used exactly once. And anagrams appear all throughout pop culture, not just in Dungeons and Dragons' name. For example, most people will recall that Tom Marvolo Riddle revealed his anagrammatic pseudonym when he said, I am Lord Voldemort. And classic rock fans of a certain age will remember that Mr. Mojo Risen from the hit song L.A. Woman by the Doors was actually an anagram of the band singer-songwriter's name who we hope we don't have to name. It's Jim Morrison, Philistines. <laughs> but anagrams go back a lot further than that, and they have been used by some very smart people to do more than simply hide clever self-references in pop culture works. For example, as far back as the 4th century BC, they were being used to flatter the wealthy and the powerful. The Greek poet Lycophron was said to be a master of this. The idea was simple. You take someone's name and rearrange the letters to spell out a complimentary word or phrase. One of the best examples of this actually comes from a 1994 Simpsons episode called Lisa's Rival. The brainy know-it-all Lisa Simpson befriends a girl who she is vexed to discover is smarter than her, and who comes from a very smart family. And one game that family plays regularly is an anagram game wherein they challenge each other to create anagrams for celebrities. Lisa's rival is challenged with Alec Guinness, a classy English actor, and she comes up with the anagram Genuine Class. Lisa, meanwhile, is stumped with Jeremy Irons and can only say Jeremy's irony, rather than the slightly more esoteric Rim Enjoyers. This sort of game of rearranging names to find some complementary descriptor evolved and took on a mystical aspect. By the Roman days, anagrams were believed to have prophetic or mystical significance. Jewish Kabbalists would seek hidden meanings inside people's names, believing them to be hidden messages from God. And Christian biblical scholars would use anagrams to hide hidden meanings in the text. One of the most famous examples of a biblical anagram it came out a bit later, involves the confrontation between Jesus Christ and the Roman governor Pontius Pilate. As Pilate conducts Jesus' trial, Jesus claims to speak the truth. 
Pilate challenges him by suggesting there is no absolute truth. What is truth, he demands. Or in Latin, quid est veritas. Jesus, in the Bible, remains silent. But ancient scholars suggested the answer was an anagram of the question. Est verqui adest, which translates to, it is the man who stands before you. After the decline of Rome, anagrams fell out of favor. Yeah, okay. okay. For a long time. But then, language and clever wordplay weren't exactly popular in the Dark Ages, as civilization was recovering from basically collapsing. But they did enjoy a resurgence in popularity in the late Middle Ages, especially among scientists, scholars, and alchemists who wanted to hide their discoveries from prying eyes. Especially from the Christian Church. One of the more famous... Uh, let's pick uh, anyone up from up. there. <laughs> A little too happy. Wait a minute. <laughs> uh, quite a bit of difference there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, one such village town. But to hide their discoveries from prying eyes, especially from the Christian Church. One of the more famous examples of such an anagram was when Galileo Galilei yeah, yeah. sent a string of letters that is too long to read and impossible Smooth. to pronounce, but when unscrambled read, I have observed the most distant planets to have triple form. That was referring to his observations that other planets had objects like moons in orbit around them implying that not everything in the universe was in direct orbit around the Earth. Later still, in the 19th century, the game of celebrity became all the rage, hearkening back to the poets of ancient Greece. Basically, this was the origin of the anagram game that Lisa Simpson just couldn't get the hang of. But anagrams aren't the only form of flatteringly worded poetry game to come to us from ancient Greece and gain popularity in the Middle Ages and beyond. Another example is the acrostic poem. 
Acrostic is a portmanteau of two Greek words that mean topmost verse. Essentially, an acrostic is a multi-line verse where the first letter in each line spells out something. The oldest form, again, was spelling out someone's name. And that was an especially popular way to pay respect to a patron or a saint during the Middle Ages. To give an easy-to-find example, we'll go back to Lewis Carroll. The first letter of each line in the last chapter of Through the Looking Glass spells out the name of the real Alice, on which the fictional Alice was based. Alice Pleasance Little. In fact, the books were the result of stories that Lewis Carroll, whose real name was Charles Dodgson, which is not an anagram, told the ten-year-old Little during a boating and picnic trip. There are lots of other word games, too. But true masters of wordplay don't stop at one game. And that leads us to one of the oldest recorded and most famous of all word games in history, the Sator Square. The Sator Square combines elements of acrostics, anagrams, and a palindrome, a phrase that reads the same forward or backwards. It is a five by five grid of letters, five lines, each consisting of a single five letter word. You can read it left to right, and top to bottom. Or you can read it right to left and bottom to top. Originally, the Sador Square was thought to be an invention of clever Christian scholars created in the 4th century CE. But an example of it has now been found on the ruined walls of Pompeii, and it appears to have been inscribed in about 80 CE. It reads, if you're curious, Sator Arepo Tenet Opera Rhodus. Translation, the gardener Arepo holds and works the plow. The wordplay is admittedly more exciting than the actual translation. But go look at the thing. It's a pretty cool little bit of linguistic gymnastics. Kind of makes the Robolara Bolaro thing pale by comparison, doesn't it? Speaking of that, we should note that although Billaro was an anagram of Robolar made to pay homage to the Magic Items author, Rob Kuntz, by remembering his original D&D character... Rob himself was so bad at naming his character that he couldn't even come up with a bit of clever wordplay. The name Robolar has nothing to do with his own name, Rob. In fact, after Kuntz created the character, he couldn't come up with a name. Eager to start the game, Gary Gygax reportedly dubbed him Robolar after a gnome in a short story Gygax was writing at the time. All of that said... Okay, we're in the home stretch. I have a limited amount of time to work with here. Uh, let's see. Running time is 24.53, so about 25 minutes. And I'm sitting at 23.55, so about 24 minutes. So I've got a minute to cover, give or take. What will I do with that? I'm going to go back to one of the ones. No, 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 no. None of those are well. Okay. I'm going to see if I can find one of the short ones that I liked earlier, but was too short to use. I'll take that one. I'll take that one. 
that will work. Yeah, yeah, there it is. Okay. That'll be great. There, and come over here with it. All right, let's see how that sounds. After a gnome and a short story Gygax was writing at the time. All of that said, we should also note that the Warbo, who originally suggested this topic, the Warbo's online handle is, itself, a result of accidental wordplay that directly involved the writer of this very script. See, Matt the Warbo is actually Matthew Arbo. And his online handle was just his first and last name with no spaces. And he's given us permission to tell this story, by the way. Okay, hang on. Before we get too excited. Put that there. But due to a misreading of his name during an online charity live stream, we accidentally dubbed him Matt the Warbo. As if a warbo was a thing, and Matt was an example of one. And the name stuck. Because really, don't all gamers love clever word games? Even accidental ones? This has been... Okay. Uh, so I'm going to go... The, the playhead, which is this blue thing with a red line, that's the playhead. Technically, that's the piece of tape that's being listened to right now. And I want to cut underneath the playhead right here on this audio, on this music. And I'm just gonna split it, which is fine. Just that one track. Okay, you see how it's in two pieces now? Okay. I don't need anything past this point. So I select it, right click it, and just delete. Okay, it's gone. Now. That leaves us weird. Don't all gamers love clever word games? Even accidental ones? This has been GM. So when we're left with weird audio, what do we do? We fade it out. And we're going to fade it from the end of the piece here. So the ding is going to be a sharp drop. And the name stuck. Because really, don't all gamers love clever word games? Even accidental ones? This has been GM Word of the Week. There you go. There you go. It's written and researched by the angry GM. And per so we ended up with a total run time of 25 minutes, 27 seconds, give or take. That's what the whole file looks like right there on your screen. Okay. You saw how the sausage was made, and you're still here. We're going to save it. And it's just going to ask you a bunch of questions of how you want to save things. Tell it your preferences. Mine is just save everything in one place so I can find it all if I need it. Okay. Yep, 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 yep. It's doing its thing. Boom, boom, boom. Now, yeah, one last one thing last to thing do. You can't listen to this on your MP3 player because A, it's not an MP3, and B, it's not anywhere you can find it. So, we saved it. Now we have to export it. Uh, and we could do a multi-track mix down if we're going to do more mixing, but we're not. So we're going to export to the media encoder. And you don't know what that is. It's an Adobe thing. It helps you make files, basically and does all the combination of the tracks, the music, the adjustments to the musics and tracks, and the leveling and equalizing and all that kind of stuff. So you get one nice final piece of work. Because <coughs> um, so far, you've only had a decent approximation 
of how the whole thing's going to sound. Now we're going to get to the final file. <coughs> so I'll take it a few minutes here. Loading up the oldie media encoder. Oh, looky there. There it is. So I just check MP3, 120 kilobytes per second, stereo, yes, 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 these are all yeses. Click OK. Then it starts exporting. <coughs> Excuse me again. So it's exporting all this information, the equalizers, the limiters, the different things we've done with the files, you know, like the fades and the trims and all that. It's exporting all that over here to Adobe Media Encoder, which is now uh, making the file, which it does rapidly on a short file. Uh, and boom, we have an MP3. Neat, huh? Um, let me show it to you. Woo! Yeah. Okay. Here it is. This is the file. Here it is, right there. That file. That file. But it doesn't look right, does it? It's supposed to look more like this one, which you may recognize. So, come over here. Open up a thing. I got a little program called an ID3 tag editor. Okay. Whoops. Click it. Ta da! Does this. Load the file. Okay. Make sure you're on your desktop. Desky Toppington. It is there, the MP3. Open that. Type in your information. Neat, huh? The title of this, the way these are titled and numbered, is 159 Iron Band of... Bilaro, you try to remember that. It's the GM Word of the Week album. Uh, it's genre is not in the drop down, so we just type in podcast. And it is track 159. That's right, I've done 159 of these. Open that up. Get back to my working folders. Uh, art assets. Album. And then we tell it to save, and then we close, and there it is. See, you can always check your info. Here is all the info we just put in. Okay. There it is. Right there. That's it. That's the thing. There it is. You want to hear it? If you want to hear it, as it finished... Say so in the chat now. Oh, there's a yes. Okay. That's all that's required. Just one yes. This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. Iron Bands of Bellaro. It will probably come as no surprise that we here at the Word of the Week love word games. After all, each one of our episodes is basically just a running game of free association. Which is why one of our favorite pieces of poetry contains the following lines. The time has come, the walrus said, to talk of many things. Of shoes and ships and sealing wax, of cabbages and kings, and why the sea is boiling hot, and whether pigs have wings. We also, as we have mentioned before, love running down a good gaming mystery. For previous examples, see our episodes about the Cloak of the Mountebank and the Elemental Deity Kosa. 
And when it comes to running down a good gaming mystery, there is no better source of mysteries than the names of various things in Dungeons and Dragons. Monsters, magical items, locations, and characters. See, for every bugbear in Malabranche that's a pretty direct reference to a piece of classical mythology, folklore, religion, or literature, there's at least two more Nistals and Blodgets that are references to such obscure things of personal interest to the authors of the game that no one in their right mind would ever know or recognize. And those actually far outnumber the Evards of the game that are just made up gibberish words. Or so claim the game's many creators. So in friend and supporter of the show... What? Nistal? Blodget, you want to know what those are references to? Okay, let's start with Blodget. To be fair, Blodgett doesn't appear to be a reference so much as a name stolen in desperation. Blodgett was a halfling thief who originally helped a party of heroes named Elweta, Ogre, Freda, Carraway, Dread Delgath, Fanstern, and Elgeus defeat the slave lords of Flinaeus. See, once upon a time, there was this series of Dungeons and Dragons adventure modules called the A series. At the time when TSR published modules, they would use letters and numbers to divide them into different series. The A series, later called the Scourge of the Slave Lords, consisted of four modules, A1 through A4, in which the heroes confronted some coastal raiders, discovered they were raiding on behalf of a massive slave ring, tracked the slavers to their lair beneath a volcanic island, and eventually escaped the dungeons of the Slave Lords. But before the modules were published and sold, they were created by TSR for use in a tournament at Gen Con 13 in 1980. And because they were tournament modules, they included a set of pre-generated characters that players would use to play through the module. The idea was basically that each group would take on the same modules with the same set of PCs, earn a score, and the party that scored the highest won. Which means the designers of the modules, David Cook, Alan Hammock, Harold Johnson, Tom Moldvay, Lawrence Schick, and Edward Carmion had to come up with a bunch of pre-generated characters and name them all. And naming characters was always a pain in the butt. Remember that. It'll be important later. For example, we're pretty sure that the character LJS is actually just Lawrence Schick's initials. We can't say that categorically, though, because we can't find any reference to his middle name. And we looked. And as for Blodgett? In 1848, a Vermont tavern owner hired a local stove maker to build an oven for his tavern. The stove maker was Gardner S. Blodgett, and he gained such a reputation for quality that soon he was making ovens for everyone. Today, Blodgett Corporation, the same company founded by that stove maker in 1848, is one of the biggest manufacturers of commercial ovens. And if you spend any time behind the counter in a pizza parlor anywhere in the United States, you've probably seen the name Blodgett scrawled across a pizza oven. Now, we fully admit that this could be a weird coincidence, but young gamers and youngish game designers spend a lot of time around pizza. So we're willing to bet it's a lifted name especially because of how common that stuff is, as you'll soon see. Take our other example, Nistal. There are a bunch of magical spells in the D&D universe that are named after specific characters. Bigby's Crushing Hand, Melf's Acid Arrow, and Morton Kanan's Lucubration. Which is not, as we often misread it to our own embarrassment when we were finally corrected, Morton Kanan's Lubrication just to name a few. And they're all named after various characters from the early days of the game. Mostly they are named after the characters people played in the earliest Dungeons and Dragons games. But Nistel's magical aura was once unique in that it was the only spell in the game named after a living human person and not a game character. It's just not the living person most people think. The spell, Nistel's Magical Aura, allows a spellcaster to imbue a mundane object with a magical aura. In essence, it makes a normal, boring, everyday thing appear to be an exciting, magical thing. It's a scam spell, a con. 
you can pass off a normal object as magical. The spell originally appeared in the 1978 Advanced Dungeons and Dragons Player's Handbook. In 1995, a recently hired TSR employee named Mike Nistel claimed that the spell had, in fact, been named after him, and that he had the distinction of being the only real person for whom a spell had been named. This was in an article in Dragon Magazine, issue 219. Look it up. Mike claimed to have gotten started playing RPGs a decade prior in 1985, which means he had a spell named after him before he played the game? That seems kind of odd. Well, Gary Gygax actually cleared up the confusion in a forum post years later. It turns out the spell was named for one Brad Nistel, a stage magician, who had suggested the idea of the deceptive spell at Gen Con one year. Interestingly, though, a game designer named Len Lakovka said he ran a game for an entire clan of Nistels one time, including Brad, Jenny, Mike, and Brian. And Mike and Brian, who both went on to be game designers at TSR and FOSA respectively, admit their father got them into role-playing games and had worked in theater, lending credence to the idea that Brad Nistel may have been their father and Gary's account might be accurate. However, Mike insists to this day that it's his name, not his father's, on the spell. And we'll probably never know the truth. But we digress. The point is that names in the Dungeons & Dragons universe are always great gaming fodder for a good complicated mystery. And as names like LJS suggest, they are also a great source of wordplay. So when friend and supporter of the show, The Warbo, suggested we explore the origins of the Iron Bands of Dilaro, a very old enchanted item from the earliest days of Dungeons & Dragons, we couldn't resist. And when we finally did figure out the mystery, we had a hearty laugh, because of all the people who could have suggested this particular topic, it was most appropriate coming from the Warbo. But we'll come back to that. The Iron Bands of Billero are... Or, or the Iron Bands of Billero is... Or, well... Okay, so this is one of those tricky things where the item is singular but contains a plural in the name so the subject-verb agreement is a pain and no matter how you try to say it, it doesn't sound natural and however you write it, you know your editor and producer is going to have an aneurysm and change it. So we're going to do this in the most clumsy but grammatically accurate way we can think of. The magical object known as the Iron Bands of Billero is are a sphere of entwined metal ribbons that when thrown at a target and activated with an appropriate magic word, expand or expands and envelops the target, ultimately imprisoning him or her like a metal mummy. And if you're a fan of the Critical Role Live Play podcast, you might recognize that object as part of Vox Machina member Percival's arsenal. Percival, or more correctly Lord Percival Frederickstein von Musel Klausowski del Rolo III, lately of Whitestone also chose not to deal with the whole issue of singular proper noun phrases with plural words by giving his object known as the Iron Bands of Billero a nickname. He calls it Manners. Now, the Iron Bands of Billero are, or is, as we said, an old magic item. Older than you might think, but not as old as we hoped. There's no great mythic story we could find that inspired the object. It appears that it's a D&D &D original. And the object known as the Iron Bands of Billero first appeared in the 1985 optional rules supplement Unearthed Arcana. Or at least they first appeared there under that name. But they first appeared in Dungeons and Dragons 11 years earlier. In 1974, Robert J. Kuntz, friend to Gary Gygax and one of the original gamers who tested the very first version of D&D, &D, Robert J. Kuntz designed a section of the sprawling underground complex known as Castle Greyhawk. He named it the Orc Level. And while it has never been published, we can guess at its contents. And also reflect on just how much our favorite game designers really did struggle with names. Kuntz included a magical object that appeared to be a rusted sphere made of interlocking bands of iron that could be thrown at a target to magically hogtie them and it was called the Iron Bands of 
finding. Eleven years later, when the object saw print, it was renamed to the Iron Bands of Billaro, with one L. Why? Well, most such magical objects and spells were named, in the fictional world of D&D, after their creators. But that's in the fiction of the game world. In the real world, most of the proper names in D&D are references to characters played by the original designers and testers of the game. For example, Dromage's Instant Summons was named after Jim Ward's character Dromage. And Odaluke's Resilient Sphere was named after Otis, Luke Gygax's player character in the Temple of Elemental Evil. See how this works? Well, Robert J. Kuntz played a character named Robolar for many years. And when TSR designers finally immortalized the magical object known as the Iron Bands of Billaro, they wanted to recognize its original creator, Robert J. Kuntz. But their sense of fictional consistency created a problem. Robolar was a fighter. He didn't make magical items. So they shuffled the letters of Robolar around and got Billaro. Which is why the original name only had one L. Now, these sorts of word games were actually very common. For example, you might notice that Oda Luke is pretty much just a mashup of Otis and Luke, because it recognized Luke's character, Otis. And Dromage is just a reverse of the letters in Jim Ward's name. Tensor was Ernie Gygax's character, or rather, Ernest Gygax. It's just a letter scramble. We could spend hours going through these sorts of word games in D&D, honestly. Even the demon B2 in the classic adventure Keep on the Borderlands is just a slightly altered pronunciation of the module series code. It was module B2. But these sorts of word games are actually much older than D&D. In some cases, they are as old as written language. Take, for example, Odaluk. Odaluk is an example of a portmanteau. That's a word made by combining the sounds of two or more words. Sometimes, as in Microsoft, it's two combined words, microcomputer and software, that create a new proper name. Sometimes, as in brunch, it's two combined words, breakfast and lunch, that create a new concept or word. And sometimes, as in tofurkey, it's two combined words, tofu and turkey that create something disgusting and ruin a wonderful holiday like Thanksgiving. Interestingly, though, portmanteau used to refer to luggage. It came from two French words, porter and manteau, which come from the same roots as words like portable and mantle, because it means to carry a cloak or coat. But then, in 1871... Lewis Carroll decided that it needed a different meaning, which is part of the joke. See, in the sequel to Alice in Wonderland, which was called Through the Looking Glass, Alice encounters a poem that she can't understand. The Jabberwock. It seems to contain a bunch of nonsense words. Words like slithy and mimsy. The poem itself is comprehensible, it's the story of a hero who goes off to slay a terrible monster named the Jabberwock, and he lops off its head with a vorpal sword. But vexed by the poem, Alice asks the character Humpty Dumpty about it. And Humpty Dumpty has some peculiar ideas about how language works. While he doesn't quite speak gibberish, he does insist that words mean precisely what he says they mean, even if they very clearly don't. He explains that Slithy is a combination of slimy and lithe. And Mimsy is miserable and flimsy. And thus, he says, they are like portmanteaus. Two meanings packed into one word. What's the logic there? Well, a portmanteau was a specific type of suitcase made of two equally sized halves joined together and closed. Like a clamshell two halves made whole. And that worked, the result of gibberish wordplay to make some clever point about pseudo-intellectual literary scholars inventing jargon 
to elevate themselves over the uneducated masses came the term that linguistic scholars used to describe a word made by combining two others. Which sort of proved Carol's point. But we digress. Word games. Now, portmanteaus aren't new. The word for them is recent. But new words have been appearing as a combination of old words forever, so Odaluk wasn't breaking any new wordplay ground. But neither were Dromage and Tensor and Robilar and Billaro. They were all examples of a very old form of word game known as the anagram. An anagram is a word or phrase made by rearranging the letters of a different word or phrase, and to really be proper, each letter should be used, and each should be used exactly once. And anagrams appear all throughout pop culture, not just in Dungeons and Dragons name. For example, most people will recall that Tom Marvolo Riddle revealed his anagrammatic pseudonym when he said, I am Lord Voldemort. And classic rock fans of a certain age will remember that Mr. Mojo Risen from the hit song L.A. Woman by the Doors was actually an anagram of the band singer songwriter's name who we hope we don't have to name. It's Jim Morrison, Philistines. But anagrams go back a lot further than that, and they have been used by some very smart people to do more than simply hide clever self-references in pop culture works. For example, as far back as the 4th century BC, they were being used to flatter the wealthy and the powerful. Greek poet Lycophron was said to be a master of this. The idea was simple. You take someone's name and rearrange the letters to spell out a complimentary word or phrase. One of the best examples of this actually comes from a 1994 Simpsons episode called Lisa's Rival. The brainy know-it-all Lisa Simpson befriends a girl who she is vexed to discover is smarter than her, and who comes from a very smart family. And one game that family plays regularly is an anagram game wherein they challenge each other to create anagrams for celebrities. Lisa's rival is challenged with Alec Guinness, a classy English actor. And she comes up with the anagram, Genuine Class. Lisa, meanwhile, is stumped with Jeremy Irons and can only say Jeremy's irony, rather than the slightly more esoteric Rim Enjoyers. This sort of game of rearranging names to find some complementary descriptor evolved and took on a mystical aspect. By the Roman days, anagrams were believed to have prophetic or mystical significance. Jewish Kabbalists would seek hidden meanings inside people's names, believing them to be hidden messages from God. And Christian biblical scholars would use anagrams to hide hidden meanings in the text. One of the most famous examples of a biblical anagram it came out a bit later, involves the confrontation between Jesus Christ and the Roman governor Pontius Pilate. As Pilate conducts Jesus' trial, Jesus claims to speak the truth. Pilate challenges him by suggesting there is no absolute truth. What is truth? he demands. Or in Latin, quid est veritas? Jesus, in the Bible, remains silent. But ancient scholars suggested the answer was an anagram of the question. Est verqui adest, which translates to, it is the man who stands before you. After the decline of Rome, anagrams fell out of favor for a long time. But then, language and clever wordplay weren't exactly popular in the Dark Ages, as civilization was recovering from basically collapsing. But they did enjoy a resurgence in popularity in the late Middle Ages especially among scientists, scholars, and alchemists who wanted to hide their discoveries from prying eyes, especially from the Christian church. One of the more famous examples of such an anagram was when Galileo Galilei sent a string of letters that is too long to read and impossible to pronounce, but when unscrambled read, I have observed the most distant planets to have triple form. That was referring to his observations that other planets had objects like moons in orbit around them, implying that not everything in the universe was in direct orbit around the Earth. Later still, in the 19th century, the game of celebrity became all the rage, hearkening back to the poets of ancient Greece. 
Basically, this was the origin of the Anagram game that Lisa Simpson just couldn't get the hang of. But anagrams aren't the only form of flatteringly worded poetry game to come to us from ancient Greece and gain popularity in the Middle Ages and beyond. Another example is the acrostic poem. Acrostic is a portmanteau of two Greek words that mean topmost verse. Essentially, an acrostic is a multi-line verse where the first letter in each line spells out something. The oldest form, again, was spelling out someone's name. And that was an especially popular way to pay respect to a patron or a saint during the Middle Ages. To give an easy-to-find example, we'll go back to Lewis Carroll. The first letter of each line in the last chapter of Through the Looking Glass spells out the name of the real Alice, on which the fictional Alice was based. Alice Pleasance Little. In fact, the books were the result of stories that Lewis Carroll, whose real name was Charles Dodgson, which is not an anagram, told the ten-year-old Little during a boating and picnic trip. There are lots of other word games, too, but true masters of wordplay don't stop at one game. And that leads us to one of the oldest recorded and most famous of all word games in history, the Sator Square. The Sator Square combines elements of acrostics, anagrams, and a palindrome, a phrase that reads the same forward or backwards. It is a five by five grid of letters, five lines, each consisting of a single five letter word. You can read it left to right and top to bottom, or you can read it right to left and bottom to top. Originally, the Sador Square was thought to be an invention of clever Christian scholars created in the fourth century CE. But an example of it has now been found on the ruined walls of Pompeii and it appears to have been inscribed in about 80 CE. It reads, if you're curious, Sator Arepo Tenet Opera Rhodus. Translation, the gardener Arepo holds and works the plow. The wordplay is admittedly more exciting than the actual translation, but go look at the thing. It's a pretty cool little bit of linguistic gymnastics. Kind of makes the Robolara Bolaro thing pale by comparison, doesn't it? Speaking of that, we should note that although Billero was an anagram of Robilar made to pay homage to the Magic Items author, Rob Kuntz, by remembering his original D&D &D character, Rob himself was so bad at naming his character that he couldn't even come up with a bit of clever wordplay. The name Robilar has nothing to do with his own name, Rob. In fact, after Kuntz created the character, he couldn't come up with a name. Eager to start the game... Gary Gygax reportedly dubbed him Robilar after a gnome in a short story Gygax was writing at the time. All of that said, we should also note that the Warbo, who originally suggested this topic, the Warbo's online handle is, itself, a result of accidental wordplay that directly involved the writer of this very script. See, Matt the Warbo is actually Matthew Arbo. And his online handle was just his first and last name with no spaces. And he's given us permission to tell this story, by the way. But due to a misreading of his name during an online charity live stream, we accidentally dubbed him Matt the Warbo. As if a Warbo was a thing. And Matt was an example of one. And the name stuck. Because really, don't all gamers love clever word games? Even accidental ones? This has been GM Word of the Week. It's written and researched by the Angry GM and produced by me, Fiddleback. You can support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash GM Word of the Week. You can find more at gmwordoftheweek.com and theangrygm.com. Well, there you go, guys. That's how it's done. And that's what it sounds like at the end. I <laughs> uh, hope you enjoyed this, or at least learned something. And I think my dinner is ready. So I may go do that. That being a thing, which I do. <laughs>
You're welcome. Yeah, I'll uh, see you guys in chat and around the world and on the website and all that good stuff. There's lots more episodes. Check them out. You guys have fun. Bye now.